Hey everyone, welcome back to Logic Band. If you're new around here, you can visit logic.band to get a copy of the Getting Started with Logic course. Just visit logic.band right there on the homepage. You can sign up for the mailing list. And there's also now a members area where you can get some new exclusive content, a Q&A, and other specialties and goodies. If you want to find out more about becoming a Logic Band member, visit logic.band slash member. And today I have a special guest here with me. His name is Louis Morehouse. And despite the spelling, Americans that pronounce Louis, not Louis, <laughs> which is something I had to get used to. But Louis is similar to me in the sense that we're both hearing impaired, we're both wear hearing aids, and we're making music. And Logic just happens to be our DAW of choice. So we're going to get some of Louis's backstory, get to know him a little bit, and just talk about some of the challenges we have doing this when the one sense everyone believes you got to rely on is a little impaired. So, <laughs> Louie, how you doing? Welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on. I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing all right. And you're all the way over in the UK somewhere, I believe, right? You're... I am. For any UK people listening, I'm in Bradford, which is in West Yorkshire, um, up north in England. So, that's where uh, I am. Welcome, man. We've met a few years ago now. Yeah. Probably through the WhatsApp group, if I'm not mistaken. I right? believe so, yeah. That's how we've been talking. If anyone's interested in joining the Logic WhatsApp group, by the way, just visit logic.band slash resources, and that will kind of tell you how to do it. Or yeah, just send me group. an email. <laughs> it's a good group. Um, that's yeah. how I sort of got started with, you know, learning of the kids I was... And I'm sure we'll come to the actual detail, but I, I ended up joining that group and connecting with everybody in there, and yeah, just been in there since the beginning, really. So right. it, it is a great, it's a great resource, it really is. You joined because of university, is that correct? Almost sixth form, which is like I don't know what the American equivalent would be, but like it's when you yeah, so I was uh, seventeen, I believe, when I joined. It's like um, the last year of high school. Yeah, well, the last two years of high school, yeah. That's, right, right. that's about oh, that's, it, That's yeah. right, that's right. UK does it last two years, yeah. It's the last two years, yeah. I joined because up until that point, I'd been doing music, you know, as in not like music production or music technology, but just general music for GCSEs and before that. And it got to the point in GCSE where they were like, well, what do you want to do next year for A-levels and sixth form and all of that? And I said, well, music technology is an option. I want to do that. And I said, well, your iPad and Scarlet 2 i 2 and MIDI keyboard setup ain't going to cut it for that. <laughs> Which I refused to accept at the time. But then they were like, well, you need to get a Mac. You need to get a computer. You need to get a proper DAW. The natural choice was an Apple Mac and Apple's Logic. Just to give some context, I got my computer on the 8th of September, I believe. And I started the course on the 11th of September. So, so there we are. Talk about... Uh... <laughs> trial by fire there <laughs> so, absolutely was it a natural choice to get a mac for you did they recommend a mac or how did that come about that you ended up on the mac and logic um it was because i've been using apple products at that point for many years um right. as i mentioned i've been making music and with an job, ipad and all with that. an ipad and garage band um right. for ios yeah, and it was... You um, a lot more patience than I do. <laughs> oh, honestly, it, it was only because I had no choice. <laughs> you, you, know. you didn't know what you could have been doing instead, basically. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I've heard some amazing beats made by people using voiceover with GarageBand on iOS, and every time I open it, I'm just like, I have a full keyboard at my disposal and I don't have to use a touch screen. I'm going back to my computer. So I, I never end up playing with it for very long. Oh, uh, I wouldn't go back, to be honest. Like, right. I, I did like it. When I was using I started off, get this, everybody. I started off with an iPad 2. I was rocking a 30 pin connector back in the day. You know, yeah, if you have a certain pin, age, you, you want the one that is. connection kit, and you had your, your Scarlet plugged into that and all that. Uh, well, I had a USB hub, a powered USB hub, because the iPads back then. <laughs> yeah, you I had don't to think, use a powered hub. Yeah, I didn't have a choice. I had to use that. And, um, I remember getting a Scarlet 2 r 2 first mm. gen, being a little bit like, oh my god, this is what everybody's talking about. Because I'd never owned anything like that up until that yeah. point. And I mean, it was that a bit that of thing a... was so ubiquitous. I mean, it was like 
so yeah. many people started on a Scarlet 2i2. Yeah, you know? and they are great. I don't have a bad yeah. word to say about it. It was great. I, I don't either, and, you know, I've never I've never owned one myself, but, I mean, for what they are as far as getting started out, you can't beat it, you know? No, absolutely. And I still yeah. use Focusrite interfaces now, so in my studio at the moment I've got... My main interface is an 18i20, and right. I've also got an Octopree with that. Um, right on. And, and it's solid, you know? I so, don't have any complaints about it at all. So before we get into all of those details, let's back up and, and tell us your backstory a little bit. Because you said you sure. started out on iOS. Um, what what brought you to Apple in general? How did you get started using that stuff? You know, were you a PC user before... Like, what was your journey? You said you were always a musician, it sounds like, because you were doing music yes, in school. So, you know, just kind of give us your backstory, when you got into music, when when computers or technology came involved, and, and how that kind of progressed for you. Sure. So music, for me, was kind of twofold, because my parents grew up in the 70s and 80s, so I was naturally raised on that as well, because they listened to a lot of it. And, you know, my dad loved, like, Duran Duran and simple minds and my mum loved um wham and george michael and all of that and i remember vividly one of my earliest memories ever was being in my mum's car and she had the police on it was the police greatest hits album and i think it was yeah it was every little thing she does is magic and i for some reason was at age like four captivated by the drums and I just wanted to know, like, what is that? My mum was really quite knowledgeable on it because she knew, you know, what hi-hats were and what they were doing and all of that. I was just absolutely hooked. And then the next thing I remember genuinely is coming downstairs on my fifth birthday or whatever it was, and there was a drum kit there. So I never looked back. I've been playing drums ever since, and I'm 21 now. And, and that's uh, quite the way to get into it, Stuart Cole. It is. So. <laughs> it is. I cannot yeah. play like that. <laughs> I think I think the thing to to note though is just like you were kind of immersed in the era of like killer songwriting, killer songs, you know, yeah, like just the groups you mentioned, you know, whether you like the cheesy eighty sound or not, or you think it sounds cheesy or not. Some of those songs are just like lessons in songwriting, lessons in musicality, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, like, that's that's kind of what you got immersed in from a very early yeah, age. Yeah, and like. like Duran, find me a better bass player than John Taylor. What a bass player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like it was like the all star of music era. It was. I still listen to a lot. I remember going through a phase of really not liking Duran Duran just because I heard so much of it and now I found circle. a newfound appreciation for it. That's kind of drums and then on because I also play keys as well and I would say that keys is kind of my primary instrument, I guess. But that came later on. So I remember around no, a couple of, about a year later, I was an avid Bob the Builder fan. I remember we got the Christmas special. I think it was called A Christmas to Remember. It featured... <laughs> it had a lot of those sort of random guest stars in it, including Noddy Holder from Slade and Elton John, of all people. It was a brilliant film. Me and my brother did watch it a couple of years ago just for the nostalgia, and it <laughs> it is a great film for musicians, it really is. But I remember... As a child, they sang one of Elton's songs at the end of the film, and it was Crocodile Rock. And for whatever reason, that just hooked me in, and that was it. That was, It was music all the way from then on. Again, it was the police in one sense, and it was Elton John in the rest of it, because Crocodile Rock, for whatever reason, just absolutely captivated me. And then I just went exploring Elton John's catalogue and never looked back. And recently, I actually met uh, Ken Scott, who mixed that that track, the album that he was on, which was Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player. But he mixed Crocodile Rock, and I, I'm really grateful that I actually got to say thank you to him for that, because that song is such an important part of my musical journey, and it was just nice to be able to meet someone that was involved with that track and just thank them for it. Right. And what what was the time frame of this, you said, uh, Bob the Builder? This was after you got your drum kit, so this was like probably a year or so later that you... you yeah, not you long after at all, but right, definitely right. after. Right. And then was that what got you wanting to play piano and keyboards, you were saying? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was very lucky because it just so happened that my uncle was also like taking piano lessons at the time, and I had mm-hmm. this Yamaha kicking around. Right. He didn't so you already kind of had something in the house you could use, basically. Well, yeah. It was a Yamaha PSR 262. 
Oh, the yeah, synth discovered. Not, not yeah, that it was... particular model, but the PSR <laughs> 2 series, yeah. Yeah, and it was... Do you know what? I th- I still think it was a really good keyboard, to be fair. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's only going to be so good, I guess, at that price range, but for what it was, I thought it was, you know, looking back, Some of those it was Yamaha really good. PSR, for starting out, had some really nice sounds and, and features and whatnot on them for the price yeah. range, you know? Um, I wish and, I don't. And I obviously, it, I when it comes it. to piano, <laughs> this like Roland or Yamaha, it's just a matter of which flavor ice cream you like, you know. Oh, absolutely. So, um, but yeah, I mean, in that price range, I don't think you could really beat the Yamaha stuff. Yeah, not like the drum sounds that were in them. Mm-hmm. You know, the drum sounds were great for what yep. they were. Yep. Not necessarily accurate, like to acoustic drums, but just in their own way. Well, let's be honest. It's really though, great. It wasn't accurate to anything. It was <laughs> trying to create a true. kick from a synthesized pitch. You know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I wish and that, I that had kind it. of sparked its, its own genre and subgenres over the years. So, you yeah. know, sometimes just like making the best of what you have just it sets you off on a journey at the same time you know yeah and it, that keyboard really served me well for a good mm-hmm. 10 years at least you know those right. things were pretty indestructible <laughs> right <Back laughs> that, then, that, was, they were man yeah that you they know were. eventually we killed it but right. um, not by choice you know it went through it went through the ringer quite a bit and right. lived to tell the tale for a long time but it's like, it was so, it was the coolest thing. Like, I wish I'd sampled it, and I could have done it. If I still had it, I would absolutely hooked right up to Auto Sampler, because it had uh, MIDI look, in and out. I, I'm sure somebody's already done that, and it's just a matter of doing the right stuff. Oh, uh, if someone has, if someone has, please leave a comment. <laughs> please. <laughs> if you know where we can get Yamaha PSR samples, please let us know in the comments. Oh, please, below. I will absolutely yeah. use those. So how did this transition from... Starting out with your consumer keyboard to an iPad with GarageBand and MIDI controller. How'd you get from one to the other? So the kind of bridge point, I guess, was my birthday in 2014 or 15, I forget. I got a Roland SD2U, which I'll guarantee nobody listening to this has heard of, because it never gets mentioned anywhere. Is that like an <laughs> interface, a sound module? What is this? <laughs> it's a uh, hardware digital recorder. Oh, um, like a standalone recorder. Okay, I got you. Yeah, but it's not even multi-track. I'm, I'm assuming the two meant it was a stereo recorder. <laughs> it was, but it had XLR combo inputs. With right, so you had two amp- inputs on there? <laughs> well, yeah, it had two inputs with mm-hmm. appallingly awful preamps. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you me, plug that, that anything was the into nature that of get... the business back then, <laughs> compared to what we have today. Oh, it was horrible. And it's like, it had RCA in and out as well. It had a little 3.5 mil, like, plug-in power, like, plug-in lavalier power. mic yeah. thing. Which I could never get to work, weirdly. And it recorded to SD cards. It had built-in mics as well, which were kind of like, you know, the kind of binaural kind of mic. Yeah, like stereo, thing. stereo mics, yeah. To give it credit, I'd never heard binaural audio before, and I put headphones on and recorded with this thing, and it was like, oh my god, I can hear people moving in the stereo field, that's yeah. weird. <laughs> in the I, I think those those things are nice for, like, situations where, like, you know, you want to record a band in a room or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like a rehearsal. Yeah, it's lovely for that, because you, you get the stereo separation, it's not mono, and you'd have to mic stuff up to get the stereo separation and all that. Man, sometimes people just, like, walk around recording with that, and it's like <laughs> listening to it on headphones, you just, like, want to force it to mono so everything <laughs> stops moving around. It's so weird, it's cool, I get the fact, but it was so weird to listen to it, like, just to hear. I didn't understand, and I kept putting my hand out, because I thought someone was genuinely behind me, it was so weird. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's like you, you listen to someone just like walk around like demoing something sometimes and you're just like, I'm, I'm going to put this in mono because like, you keep turning around. <laughs> it it sounds so, so lifelike. It's like eerie. Which is cool, but I, I've never, you had to think I'd never ever, not even heard it on YouTube before. Yeah, it was just yeah. the first time hearing that. I thought, this is really freaky. This is weird. Right. I still have it, by the way. It's nice. in the bottom of a drawer somewhere. Still with its original SD card in it, I think. <laughs> All of what, like 256 megabytes? I think it was 2 gig in all. Oh, nice, nice, okay. <laughs> which was quite generous looking back. Nowadays, yeah, it probably is like a, an 800 meg card. I made a couple of... It was 2014, by the way, I just realised it was because I worked backwards and realised it was 2014. How old were you around this point in time, 2014? I would have been like 13, because I okay, got it for so my 13th birthday, 13th I think. birthday, so you'd be, you'd be a teenager, 
big yeah, big but, milestone birthday and you get a recorder so right, yeah I would, I was excited about you know because right, i've never right. had anything like that before by this point i've had an iphone for three years but for so you've been using that since you're about 11 yep literally um i might have been 12 when i got it because i got it in 2011 i got an iphone right. 4 okay some of you some of you looking into this are going what on earth is that um <laughs> Because it's literally about over 10 years ago. <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, coincidentally, that was my first iPhone as well, was the iPhone. Uh, yeah, nice. It was an interesting beast. I don't remember much about it, but it was an interesting yeah. beast. Kids, get this. Kids looking to this of a certain age will find this mind-blowing. It actually it came with this thing called a headphone jack, which has really disappeared in the last couple of years. Nowadays, you can get an adapter for it, but back then, it came as part of a device. It was really quite quite it something. It came with headphones that plugged into the headphone jack. It also came with a charger cable and plug, yeah. which nowadays is unheard of. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, in, in all <laughs> fairness, though, do we really all need another charger cable and brick at this point in our in our in our technology lives? Well, like, fair, yeah, we've accumulated many over the years. <laughs> it's like not only do you have the ones that it comes with, but like you buy five, so you have one in every room in the house. <laughs> you know, this is true. Like um, they really need to put another one in the box. <laughs> not, not to give the companies a pass on their greedy behavior, but like they kind of have a point. We don't need another. This- one. No, this is, I'm lucky you bought your first iPhone, which is something, Yeah, I which, which, which is annoying in those cases, you know. Yeah. I'd had an iPhone for a while at that point, and for whatever reason, I'd never thought to look at apps in that field. Like in the music field. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess it, because it was such a new concept, having a phone, I was trying to get yeah. my head around that alone right, right. for a while. And then I got this recorder, and the reason I got this recorder, actually, because in 2014 I discovered podcasting and was actually doing a lot of podcasting and internet radio, which, mm-hmm. as you can imagine, as a 12-year-old, must have been So, so wait, you're telling me that you're a blind person who got into recording themselves talk and broadcasting it on the internet while playing music. Well, I've yeah. Never heard of that before. I know. <laughs> <laughs> used to broadcast on the platform called Spreaker, which I believe still exists. Yeah, yeah, um, I remember that one. Yeah, it's it's uh, it was cool. I think right. I still have a plan with it because I've still got I some think old. I did live three sixty five back in the day. Ah, uh, I never, I never used that. I, think I was I aware just of aged it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Spreaker is still a thing because it's actually it's a it's a really good actual like audio hosting platform. You're anyway. Right. Right. Um, back in the day when I was using it, you had 30 minutes live broadcasting time for free. Nowadays it's 15, which is, yeah. And I used to in, broadcast... In all honesty, I think that's all most people need, because they really <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> in the future, everybody will be world famous for 15 minutes. Spreaker is providing <laughs> you those 15 minutes. <laughs> no more, no less. <laughs> and I used to do, do, you know, crappy radio stuff type things thankfully none of them exist anymore um because <laughs> i was a 12 year old doing this thing and it must have been horrendous and right. it was all you know inbuilt iphone microphone stuff you know happy days yeah, yeah. and now we're gonna play a song <laughs> hang on um hold on now <laughs> swipe 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 with voiceover sounds bleeding through. okay here we go do 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 yeah <laughs> um, so we got a lot of that. And John, then... Crocodile Rock. Double tap to play. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start the song now. <laughs> you may or may not have heard that I found it. <laughs> Welcome to the next 30 minutes of Just the Police. Um, <laughs> so getting that recorder was kind of a breakthrough for me because it's like, oh my god, mm-hmm. this is, these have XLR sockets that I've heard all these podcasters talking about. I've never seen them before. What are these big round things on the front? <laughs> I don't know what these are. Are these XLRs? They must be. I don't know what else they yeah. could be. Why have they got a hole in the middle? I remember the first time I saw those combi jacks, I thought that was genius. It is yeah. still quite genius, I think. Yeah. It's like, a brilliant you can idea. Plug in an XLR or a quarter inch, it doesn't have to take up like extra space. It's a genius thing, it really is. Yeah. And now it's like on every interface, so you know. <laughs> yeah. And it's Not as amazing as it was in like 2014 <laughs> when we first thought. When I got my first piece of audio hardware with its yeah. awful preamps. So then from there, I started building up like a little arsenal of equipment i remember going to dawson's music in leeds and just going into the shop and going i remember my parents going we bought him this and we don't know what cables we need to plug things in <laughs> um 
because I didn't know at the time, and they didn't know either. So we walked out with just a load of cable, XLR leads and wide cables and RCA bits and pieces. and Everything you needed to connect everything. Yep. And then I started making like rough recordings on that, you know, plugging in my old Yamaha, which by this point, it's headphone jack broke, so I only had the left channel, but hey-ho, we may do. Hey, yeah, you only need them in mono anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> Although if you monoed it, the whole thing disappeared, which was a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> So, you so had it was to... really you were really just recording the left side of stereo. It wasn't even like a mono yeah. signal. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. And okay. then at that point, I had another Yamaha. We had one of those, you know, those like digital pianos at Yamaha. Yeah, those... yeah, like the DG series, probably. Yeah, I think it was a Clavinova back then. That's also sadly no longer with us, but it was quite cool. I didn't like how heavy the keys were because I didn't understand that pianos had weighted keys. I used to record some stuff on that. Now it was awkward because the Yamaha piano recorded mm. normally. So mm-hmm. it's kind of weird. You'd have piano, you know, nice in the middle, and then just <laughs> some strings or whatever off to the left, and there was nothing you could do about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was so this weird. Is, this is just like stereo recording. So you're just like piling on top of piling, like <laughs> yeah. And because it's only it, the blend you get. Because it's only a stereo recorder as well, no, no multi-track. What I would have to do is, is record individual parts, because I was doing a lot of covers. So I'd have the song on on one pair of headphones, be monitoring off the recorder with the other, juggling headphones, and playing along to it. And then I'd import them. I discovered Dropbox around a similar time, which I'd never heard of before, and that blew my mind as well. I had to import the WAV files off. I had to give my dad the SD card so that he could put the files in Dropbox for me. Because mm-hmm. I didn't have a computer still, and then I'd have mm-hmm. to import them into an app called Boss Jock, which mm-hmm. I think has been discontinued. But the idea of that was you could load sounds into um, carts and carts, yeah, yeah, like and a, hit them like a radio to play them. DJ yeah, which is why I had it. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's why I had it because radio mm-hmm. and podcasting. Right. I would have to. This is so weird. I had to <laughs> figure out when to hit play on the right stem. <laughs> <laughs> to then get them to sync up and record to a wave file. <laughs> it was so, and there was no timing reference or anything like that. It was horrible. And if I got so, one stem wrong, I had to start the whole thing start again. The whole it was process. Horrible. So, so, so to visualize this, you basically brought these in. It's kind of like having them on on different <laughs> triggers, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Each, each every time you tapped like another cart. It was that one starts playing, playing. that file. Yeah, 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 so yeah. You basically so have to, to record all, all of these pieces individually while listening back to the other one that you already recorded, right? Yeah, not even that. Listening to the or cover listening to the that original I was doing. Song. Except, yeah. So there was no so you, reference to the other part. Yeah, so you're listening to the original <laughs> song, playing along, record your keyboard part, then you play along, record your bass part, then you play along, record, like, you know, your drum. Oh, my little electronic drum kit that I had. Right, my Roland right, right. HD3. So, yeah. so you're, everything is referenced to the original song, not even, like... Not starting other. at the same point, necessarily. <laughs> and then you brought these all into another app via Dropbox. your dad taking your SD card, putting it on his computer, putting it in Dropbox. You then <laughs> yeah. went to Dropbox on your phone, <laughs> brought these into Boss Jack, spread them out across these different... Start parts, recording. And then Boss start Jack. a recording and trigger them. And if you mistriggered one of them, you had to start the process all over again. That's about until the Until you got your stereo file <laughs> yep. with everything in sync. Yep. <laughs> and so I thought awful. recording a tape was complicated. <laughs> it was so horrible. So because of that, I could really relate to people going, oh, you don't know how hard it was back in the day of pre laptop. And I'm like, yes, I really do. <laughs> I really, really do. <laughs> you don't understand how badly I complicated everything when I started out. <laughs> oh, it got even worse. So, yeah, I, I didn't have to align a tape machine, but yeah, trust me, I feel I, your pain. I had to align other stuff. With no reference whatsoever, apart from when I hit play. Right. <laughs> and God forbid if a part came on later in the song and it didn't start at the beginning of a song, then you were really, you know, <laughs> bricking it at that point. <laughs> you... Please, please be in sync, please be in sync. Oh, it's not. Start again. <laughs> you must have had the patience of a saint. Like well, I only did off. I only did a few pieces like that and then didn't bother. Yeah, but. <laughs> yeah it, was, it was just like, there, there's, a, there's a point of diminishing returns where you're just like, you know... <laughs> I can't do this, this anymore. <laughs> this isn't worth it. It got even worse when I got a Zoom H1 and started recording, like, you'd record one track mm-hmm. on, like, the Roland, and then I'd 
plug that into my Behringer 1204 mixer and then record the output of that into the Zoom while playing another part on top of the Roland part, <laughs> just bouncing between the two recorders. I mean, that's <laughs> easier. At least you have a reference. It is. It is, yes, but there's no multitrack still. It's still like, you kind of, it's yeah. like bouncing down on a four track. On a four know. track machine, yeah. Yeah. yeah which, is, which is how I started, to be honest. Oh, with yeah, you. okay. Yeah, it's so, very similar, I guess, in principle. Yeah. yeah. So and from I there, don't miss it. no, I don't miss what I just described either. Um, I don't recommend it to anyone. Get an yeah. iPad. If, if um, anybody, is, if anybody is really <coughs> curious, send me a message. I got a four-track machine. I can sell you real cheap. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? It'll be easier than doing it my way. I've still got both recorders, but I don't plan on making it easy with them again. Yeah, yeah. If like you know when Paul McCartney started doing like, you know stuff where he was like oh yeah i'm gonna go back and record this on four track like i do to do back in the day it's like i'm not doing that you know what i'll just limit myself to four tracks in logic sorry <laughs> yeah i'll do that i'm not going back to the old way yeah there's I'm no romance there at all yeah. <laughs> and let alone, that's not even mentioning all the that's going on on the world exactly recordings. <laughs> i'll just get a tape plug in if you really want the noise <laughs> Yeah, I didn't need a tape plugging back then. I had, I had horrible preamp to do that for me. Exactly. Um, but in digital, glorious digital clipping. L- yeah, um, glorious digital. <laughs> it also had a metronome on it, I remember, which you couldn't change. So whatever tempo it was, that was that was all you could do. I don't know why that right. was the case. But and then so was that one twenty? Uh, I don't know. It was like. Oh okay. Whatever that is. Right. <laughs> Um, like one third. Somebody something. please recapture that, cut it out, and then throw it in Logic and use um the uh, the tempo guessing feature of Logic. Yeah, to please do. What tempo that was. <laughs> if you really want, I'll get a sample of the original what the one. Feature was called. <laughs> and then yeah, so from that nightmare, mm-hmm. um, I was really keen to find. Weirdly, I was really keen to find another way of doing things. I wanted a change of scene. I can't imagine why. <laughs> So I ended up with an iPad, and then it was like, oh, you can get the camera connection kit and plug the USB things. I was like, okay, let's do that. So I got a USB-powered hub. I researched it. I got a USB-powered hub, because there was more people doing this on YouTube, so I didn't have to oh, guess yeah. everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I could research it. I knew what XLRs were at that point. So I got the camera connection kit, which back then, everybody, it was a th- the 30-pin version, and it didn't have the pass-through, you know, the power pass-through that it could do on a VAT. So you had to charge the iPad up before you could do anything. And then when the iPad started running out of charge, that was the end of music time. So I got that. I got a Focusrite 2i2 first gen. I got the worst keyboard known to man, I think. The M Audio key station. The cheapest keyboard known to man. <laughs> oh, it's awful. <laughs> I think Elises <laughs> might have some stuff that might be about the same price or cheaper. But... Yeah, like the VI series or whatever it's called. Or the Q- yeah, no, the Q. The, the Q series. The Q sorry. series, yeah. The Elises Q... And the, the VI is station. actually pretty decent, I think. Yeah, but the, the key, key and the key wasn't. station, like the key station pros were decent too. Mm, I never like, saw them. I just got the basic yeah. whatever the hell. The key station <laughs> and the Qs, man, just ugh. Yeah, the Qs were they're, they're very springy for a reason. Yeah, they were very springy. The Qs, I remember, we had them at school. Yeah. So at this point, I mean, secondary school or high school, I guess. I was using a key station. It was horrible, but I may do a key station 49 mark one i believe it was and i went through so many of them because they get breaking i kind of heard that about those my mate josh people looking into this you'll absolutely relate because he went through even more than me <laughs> he went through about five of them in the space of about a year wow <laughs> then he bought an elitist vi 49 in like 2017 and he still uses that so there okay. you go right. i remember at school we had the m audio key studios which i thought were quite a cool concept Mm-hmm. When you had like the keyboard, but with an interface and I/O and stuff in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of companies made those at, back then. Yeah, they were and cool. I kind of wish they stuck around because the, nobody yeah. really does that anymore. But like, as a beginner piece, what more could you ask mm-hmm. for? You know. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Because like, there are a lot of players now who they're more electronic musicians, so they really just need a MIDI controller and like maybe one or two inputs for the one mic to record pretty, vocals you know. or something. Yeah, so like, guitar, yeah, you know, bass, like yeah. And one XLR and maybe like, you know, a DIN for like an instrument or something. Yeah. I mean, you know, this this literally all they need, that and a MIDI controller. And, and how about one, one unit? Piece. Yeah. Yeah. And it had MIDI output on it as well, which was cool. Yep. So you had more options there. It was really quite, a, I don't know what the preamps were like. 
probably yeah, slightly sure better than my world. I'm sure they about, but I mean... I hope they were better than my world number one back in the day. Um, <laughs> the knobs on it were horrible because they kept coming off. We had a classroom full of them, and that's sort of when I started studying music at high school. We had a classroom, mm-hmm. and it was full of key studios. And I remember... At this point, you're more, you're still more of a player than for, on the production technology side of things. So. Yeah, I'm getting there, because yeah. I'm, okay. I'm okay. messing around in garage band and making things and, mm-hmm. you know, getting to grip. Not necessarily good stuff, but learning. Yeah. So that's what matters, right? You, you, you're, getting, you're getting your bearings and you have access yeah. to equipment at school. So you're yeah. kind of getting familiar with it there too. But at this point, you're still more thinking of it from like, I want to create music. And yes. Then, you know. You haven't gotten to that point until they said, what do you want to do next year? You know. Yeah, and that was when it was like, you know, bringing things up to Percy. Like I said, I want to do music technology because I mm-hmm. didn't enjoy GCSE music, to be honest. Right. And what was that? Was that more like theory and performance and stuff like that? or? Yeah. Yeah, it was very theoretical and it was a lot of analysing, which I quite enjoyed looking back. The analysing stuff yeah. was very good, but... I just, I remember, and this isn't meant as, you know, against anybody in particular, but mm-hmm. this is just one thing that I remember thinking, and I still think this now, is we were doing Haydn's The Clock Symphony, mm-hmm. and we were we were analysing that, and I remember we had questions about it in our GCSE exam, and I remember vividly doing those questions, and then thinking, oh, I've got, I've got 10 minutes left. I'll just, just to pass the time, I'll read a few other questions that we're not, we've not been told to do. I'll just mm-hmm. read them just to pass the time. And I turn over the page and it goes, the Beatles, Sergeant Pepper. Question one. It's like, we're not doing Sergeant Pepper. Why did we not do that? <laughs> right. <laughs> Why did we not do Sergeant Pepper? <laughs> like, I uh, yeah, I'd have thrown myself right into that. <laughs> I might still be doing that today if we did Sergeant Pepper. <laughs> oh God, absolutely. It was like we could have done. And I read the questions. And I can't remember what they were now, but I remember mm-hmm. at the time thinking I could have answered that. <laughs> absolutely. Right, right. Yeah, and to this day, I still kind of think, why on earth did we not do Sgt. Pepper? <laughs> you know. Because you got to um, do classical music, because rock and roll is not an art form like classical Oh, is. goodness. Oh, I got more of that as we went on, you know. I went to Leeds College of Music later on for Saturday school, which was amazing, and I wouldn't change anything about it. It was fantastic. There were certain students there, not all, but there were certain students yeah, there. Yeah, you, you ran into that <laughs> set, and it's just a matter of whether they I'm were in, classical. I got grade five clarinet. <laughs> oh, good for you. What do you do? I, I play piano and I, I like pop music. Oh. <laughs> oh, you're, you're a peasant. What are you doing there, peasant? <laughs> what jazz do you listen to? I, 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 not really my vibe, to be honest. <laughs> you know. I, I like it when they know what they're doing and they get it right the first time. <laughs> yeah, I like it when they all play the same song. That's a quote from my great granddad. <laughs> who said, who I loved like jazz. better when... When the piano player is actually a part of the band and didn't decide sitting on his piano to show off how many keys he could press at once is part of the song. Look at how many notes I can play. Now I have a respect. I do respect the eyes, but I still think that some of it sounds yeah. like, yeah, they're all playing uh, It's just like, like, I'm with you. Like, uh, you know, I respect it. I can appreciate it. But let's be honest. Those stereotypes that we just quoted exist for a reason. Oh, they exist. It's like the classic joke of what's the difference between a jazz musician and a rock musician. A rock musician plays three chords to a thousand people, and a jazz player plays a thousand chords to three people. And, and no. my personal favorite, the first time it's the mistake, the second time it's jazz. <laughs> the classic one, which I still bring out every now and then, is I said to my mum that when I grew up I wanted to be a musician, and mum said, well, you can't do both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're kind of proving that one wrong a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. It's especially poignant because I'm in my final year of university, so after this mm-hmm. year, I have to really think about <laughs> what I want to do after that. And the answer still is music, so yep. we'll see how we go. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get together again, like, you know, five years in the future. So, what are you doing now? <laughs> did you go up or did you uh, do music? I a desk and answer phones all day. I, mean, I still play my <laughs> piano sometimes after work, if I'm in the mood, but... Usually have to deal with customers. I don't want to bother even touching that yeah. either. I still do it on the side occasionally, but not often. <laughs> Sometimes I'll get my old Roland out and do some stuff with that. <laughs> I had to sell all my other gear, so yeah, it's all I've got left. <laughs> it's all I've got left. I, I don't want to use a computer anymore. I just check my mail on the phone, so I just <laughs> plug in some headphones and play my Roland. Yeah, and sometimes I'll get Boss Jock up again. I managed to find an app that lets you run old software. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So you but, decided to do yeah. music technology. <laughs> yep, I did. And things and got better. <laughs> that got you back to the that got you into learning logic. the Mac and logic. Now At the was same logic time. recommended also or is this just Apple makes <laughs> logic also, so you know. That was kind of it. It was uh, I was already using Apple stuff, so it made sense to keep using Apple stuff. Right, right. Um right. And obviously, Apple made logic, so it seemed like the yeah. most reasonable decision, you know, right, right. as far as accessibility. Because well, I didn't realize that it wasn't the case where all DOWs weren't mm-hmm. accessible. You figured it's Apple's like, got a decent track record with accessibility. Yes, Love absolutely. Because Garage Band was pretty good. And so. boy, could you be <laughs> any more wrong sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to import samples into Quick Sampler? Nah. Um, you don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> right. That's my main bug. You want to with... import multiple samples at once and assign them to different keys inside the sampler? We used I mean, to let you do you that. We don't now. You used to be able to do it with XS24, <laughs> but you don't need that functionality anymore, blind people. <laughs> don't worry about it. We'll handle that. <laughs> oh, we'll just automatically it... map it across the keys for you. Don't worry. <laughs> you, you, why do you need it on specific keys? <laughs> don't worry. We'll do it for you. You can't possibly do it on your own. Um, you literally can't. We've taken it away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And also the fact that it, I, I missed the fact it was called EXS24. Like, I miss it being called that. I want to do this in Sampler. Which which one? <laughs> sampler or Quick Sampler? Or yeah. Drum Kit Designer? Or <laughs> Alchemy? Or, like... Or Drum Synth, or whatever it's called. A drum, um, um, yeah, Drum Synth, yeah. <laughs> That's another one, too, yeah. Never need that. <laughs> it, it's it's like, actually a pretty cool synth. I've, I've messed it? with it a little bit, but, like, yeah, it's it's... It, it's just the, the whole, like, using what they give us is great. Trying to import our own samples is where this thing falls down right now. Yeah, it yeah. used to be a lot nicer. You can't you even say to, like, you know, be like, oh, did this work in the XS24? Now it doesn't work in sampler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which that, doesn't that's, make any sense. That's, like, one of the most frustrating things. Like, it, to, to the, the Logic team's credit, they, most things get fixed pretty quickly. For whatever mm. reason, this one didn't. No, and I miss it terribly. I started on ten four two. I want to say. Oh, you came in at a good time. Yeah, because we just got studio strings and all of that. Yep. Because that was in ten four, right? So yeah, ten four, ten three. Yeah, one of those. So I had that, and you got to remember as well. But at that point, I had no idea what regions were and how they worked. They were a big mystery to me for a long time. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I knew that people copied and pasted audio on the computer, and I, that blew my mind. It's like, how do you do that? Yeah, you know, because yeah. on GarageBand that doesn't exist. At least with voiceover, right. with GarageBand, what you had to do was you had to map your different sections down, like tell it you were going to do a section of eight bars. The only way you could copy and paste was to duplicate sections, and but that bought everything it. with it. Yeah, yeah, and then you had to go in and take out the stuff you didn't want from that section and all that. Well, you couldn't even do that. That's a thing. As far as I was aware, yeah. you couldn't even do that. You just had to live no. with it. I think a lot, a lot more of that stuff is accessible now in Garage. Band yeah, it whatever. probably is. Logic made I mean, it a that, lot that easier. That sounds kind of like the arrangement view in Logic, which is still not accessible. But you know, it <laughs> sounds similar to that work. Yeah, though. and, and know. I kind of work around it with with locators and stuff like that too. So. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's they plot. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. Plot using locator, but you didn't have the choice of taking the individual layers away. It was yeah, just yeah. everything. It was as if you'd done it on like a stereo file, you know, like it was mm-hmm. just a section. So I did that. I had logic, and I was, you know, making making things. At that point, I was using a new a new Yamaha, a PSRE. I'd really moved with so the time. This, this was this was <laughs> like a, a basic keyboard that had some onboard sounds, but then you just were using the MIDI I/O. Yeah. Oh wow. Well, it had logic. USB. I oh, moved yeah, on yeah, from my MIDI, right. my five pin MIDI to a USB MIDI thing. Right, right. So um, you could just plug it in directly to the Mac. Yeah. And it showed up as a MIDI controller in Logic, basically. Yeah. And I, but it yeah. didn't have a pitch bend and it didn't have octave buttons. So it was right, very limited. Right. I remember posting in the Logic group. This is in September 2018. And I posted mm-hmm. in the Logic group going, Does anyone know of any good MIDI controller that I can use with Logic? And, and this I remember is where all- you got introduced to the drug. <laughs> <laughs> and Andre replied, going, well, I recommend you buy the Native Instruments S61. I bet that was a bit of a culture shock when you looked that price up. <laughs> it was, and I had to, you know, it was, you know, coming up to Christmas, and I had to act Santa very politely, please can I have this keyboard? <laughs> <laughs> 
There's, there's a secret version of Louie doing Santa baby begging for an S61 out there that nobody wants to hear. <laughs> recorded on my old world and the last thing I recorded on GarageBand. On my iPad mini, whatever the heck it was by then. Right. <laughs> this time with my charger included, so I could actually pass charging through the adapter, so I could yeah, keep so you could work making all night. music. Yeah, if I wanted to, I could do that now, which was a genuine novelty at the time. So Santa delivered, and for Christmas 2018, I received an S61, which is over there. And he's <laughs> and been hooked ever since. I have, and I now have three native instruments keyboard <laughs> i didn't go right i got one now let's get some more i got the a61 later on to like do gigs and stuff and i got way, you can just leave the s61 at home yeah this s61 hasn't left this room in the whole time i've had it it's so moved around the, the room one. no no this is the mark two okay okay i'm very glad i got it to be mm-hmm. honest i'm very glad that was my first one and i'm very grateful for that because if i had like a 25 or 49 key i think i would have you know, I would have been Put able to do it, but I would have missed it. I would have been like, "Wish I could answer a bit nicer and got on the <laughs> the 61." I'm very glad I got I got it. It wasn't easy, but you know, mm-hmm. because it's so expensive, and I did I did contribute towards it. But right, right. I'm very happy with it. It served me well and continued to serve me well. Now I have the so M32 as the well S61, and the A series. The A61 and the M32, which is currently living at university because they don't have any native instrument keyboard there, so I've left it there. Makes when sense. Makes I need sense. It. They came, you know, in various points over the years, and that's mm-hmm. kind of where I'm at now, really. Right, with a lot right, more, right. there's a lot more equipment involved, but uh, right. that came and went over the years. But that's the core of Logic, my MacBook Pro, and my S61. Right on. So you're mostly like a keyboard player creator these days yeah so like you're one of those people that kind of live in front of the s61 or you know a61 whatever and yeah. mostly drive logic from there yeah really only using the laptop keyboard if you need to like you know change a track name or something well now um, not even that because the way my mm-hmm. studio is arranged i can't reach the laptop so i have an apple magic keyboard you, that right on right right yeah one of my a, one like a one side of my native instrument. Yeah, so that's right. controlling the Mac. Yeah. So I don't actually have to touch them. That was inspired yeah, by Andre. Much how, yeah, that's how I have my desk set up too because I have my, my laptop like on a higher level. So I just yeah. had like a little Bluetooth keyboard next to me. Granted, um, I'm not and using that works. complete controlled, but yeah, similar <laughs> setup. Absolutely, and it works. You know, it works well. That's sort of how I've been doing things ever since, you know. Right, yeah, driving right. it from that little So when you record audio panel. too, because I, I, I'm sure you record like audio sources in addition to just electronic sources from the keyboard. Are you still running Logic from your S61 for the most part? Or are you using your keyboard for that part? Yeah, like so your computer keyboard, your Bluetooth keyboard. Both, really, because I do stuff okay. like transport and metronome on and off, and tap tempo and undo and quantize and all of that from the from the keyboard, and then yes, from the S sixty one, and then, and then everything else is from the Apple keyboard, just sat on top of it because that works. Oh, that's right. You, know, you have right a sixty one, so you have plenty of room on there to put the Bluetooth keyboard on. Yeah, on it's a the perfect S61. little spot, really. And then my iPad is sat on the other side, right, whatever right, I want right. to use that, which isn't often, but right. you know. Sometimes I play around in that because Garage Band still gets things a bit earlier. A bit earlier than Logic, yeah. A lot of the sound yeah. packs and stuff go to Garage Band on iOS first, yeah, and then eventually they bring them over to Logic. So before they come over to Logic, you kind of got to like use them in Garage Band on iOS and then share the project to your computer and open it on the Mac and then you yeah, the sounds in the Logic that way, yeah. Yeah, so I still have it for that really just to play around. My iPad has another keyboard connected to that, keyboard. so I can play that. No, no. So I have a Yamaha Reface. Oh, like, oh a MIDI keyboard. Um, MIDI keyboard. Okay. Yeah. I've got a Yamaha Reface CP, which I mm-hmm. love a lot. It's great. Just to be able to turn a keyboard on and play straight away. Mm-hmm. That was something I missed for a long time about a Yamaha that I had, you know, with my iPad and my Mac for a while before I got the complete control. Was I missed you had sound being able to in, turn it on. Turn it on and play. Yeah. And yeah. I, I really missed that. I've got amazing piano sounds. I've got Keyscape. I've got Piano Tech. I've got Contact. <laughs> I've got everything. You know, I've got all that. And that's lovely. I'm you but... want to play the Yamaha after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But like, I but don't know. But I get I guess you. It's... There there are times you just want to turn on and play something. You don't want to have to yeah. like, spend time, you know, instantiating the track and picking turn sound. Turn the speakers and... on. Turn all the plugs yeah. on. You know. Yeah. I just yeah. don't want to do that. I just want to be able to, you know, reach over and go and play you know, yeah, yeah. and I, I have written a lot of stuff on it, you know. I had to wait like seven months for the thing to turn up because I ordered it in March 2022. It didn't arrive until September, but I'm very grateful yeah. I didn't cancel the order. 
right, right. <laughs> and it's it's great, and it's portable, so, and it's got just damn pedal input and stuff. It's great. Is it accessible in any meaningful way, or is it just a lot of knobs and buttons and memorizing your way around it? Yeah, it, it, so there's no screen on it, and it's just all like little flicky switchy to turn effects on and off. They're like three-way switches, so like the middle is off. One way is one effect and the other way is the other. For example, the first switch in, one way is a, a wah, and the other way is like a, a phaser. Around that switch you've got a knob for like the intensity, and you've got a knob for the speed, because they're kind of applied to both. Mm-hmm. And you know, you move on, you've got a chorus, and it's the same way. You know, just right. really dedicated controls for everything. And then you've got like right, right. So a master reverb to... thing. So once you get familiar with it, it's easy enough to like dial up a sound relatively yeah. quickly and get and, and just start playing, basically. Yeah, and that's so, why I like it. That's why I wanted to get it because mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. having you know something outside of the box just to play on, really. And the yeah. sounds aren't, they're not awful, they're not yeah. PSRE quality, I don't think. I think they're a little right. bit better than that. They're not Keyscape, but yeah, 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 that's yeah. fine, you know. But you could, you could like, if you had to, you could, like, take that on a gig and get a sound and, and perform yeah, like that, too. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, if I'm going on the holiday and for whatever reason, I don't want to take the laptop. Yeah, yeah. I can you take can the bring your phone and, and just bring that, and, and you're good to go. And a pedal, yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah. I'm good. So, right. yeah, and I love that. And it's got USB MIDI, so I've got that mm-hmm. running to the iPad. So if I do want to ever play on the iPad again, I can uh, play it from you there. still got MIDI out there. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Without having to like, right. unplug the complete control or anything like that. As far mm-hmm. as audio, yep. I've got yeah, the focus rights. Uh, Scarlet 18i20, second gen, and uh, Scarlet Octopri, which doesn't have anything connected to it at the moment. That's kind of my but situation got... too. i got a Claret yeah. Octopri that I haven't hooked up yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I'm glad I have yeah. it. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but it's ready and waiting. I don't have to worry about running out of inputs. I've got things like an old phone just to be listening to stuff. My so you kind of got everything routed in. through it so you can like yeah. just have that one pair of headphones or your studio monitors and listen yeah. to music or whatever. You know. Yeah, it's all coming through one thing. Right, so like, right, so we right. mentioned studio monitors and things? Yeah, yeah. What's your current setup like in that regard? Okay, so in that regard, I have the output of the interface coming to a audience Nero. Right on, that's your monitor controller, so that allows you to have multiple monitors hooked up. Yeah. So that you can see it from from the output of your interface. It's a great monitor controller. It's got a headphone amp built in as well, a four-way headphone amp, which is great. So Mm -hmm. I don't need to have a separate one of those, which is what I used to have. I used to have the Mackie Bing Four. Four, okay, okay. Wow, Um, yeah, so you don't need a separate, okay. Which is great, because I used to have an art head amp 4, which I still have, and I take back to sessions. And I used to use a Mackie Big Knob. That was awkward when I got that for Christmas, I can tell you that. Mm-hmm. What did you get for Christmas, Louie? Well, Grandma, let me tell you. It says Big Knob. Right. Right, okay then. Everybody was, like, having pictures taken with it and everything. It was weird. <laughs> That's an Instagram it. moment right there. Yeah, I wasn't on Instagram at the time. I should have been. But then I grew out of that in a sense, but I just needed more outputs for monitors mm-hmm. because I wanted to expand. Because you had more monitors than you had room for on the big knob? Yep, absolutely. Because one out, you had to remember, one output pair is taking up feeding the head amp. Mm-hmm. So I only really had one output. So we now have the audience Nero, and that's getting feed from my mixer and my interface, because I have a mixer as well, an old Mackie that I've had for years, ProFX 16, which is great, love it a lot. Which is really useful actually for just routing audio to different sources, apart from anything else. My SM7B, which I'm speaking on now, is going through that, and it's been compressed and things, and it's just just nice to have that. Oh, so you're using the effects on the mixer, basically. Yeah, just one knob compression, yeah. We've got feeds from that, and they're going out too. In terms of monitoring, we have a very good friend of mine, he's letting me, has been for the last, like, seven years, been letting me take care of his old pair of monitors, which are a pair of Genelec 1029As, which are lovely. They're wasted yeah. in this room because it's not acoustically treated, but they're still nice. I'm sure they're still nice to listen to. <laughs> they are, and I'm happy to take care of them and to keep the coil going. Keep that coil moving for him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for those. And then I have my recent acquisition, which is a pair of IK Multimedia iLoud MTMs. MTMs, yeah. Which are I lovely. got a pair of those too. And... They're better than they really yeah. have a right to be <laughs> if if you're on a budget for monitors you cannot honestly unless you just want something bigger <laughs> yeah you know if you want and something even then bigger, you'd be surprised what these can deliver 
I'm looking I, up I like the name. honesty of them. And I think a lot of people, you know, like having that big vibrating low end and sexy and everything. And everybody wants to hear that. And they want the monitor that can bump that stuff. Not to say that these can't, but yeah, yeah. there's such a focus on the mid range with these that I really like. And and even though the smaller ones, the I loud micro monitors, they don't like, have the arc technology either. They're just speakers. Essentially. Yeah. They, they have some like switches on the back. So you can kind of tune yeah. it a little bit, but yeah. yeah, they don't, they don't have the arc technology to, to tune to where the MTMs do, but I'm telling you, man, like if you're on a budget and, and you just want something that's small and portable and doesn't take up a lot of room like big monitors do, you can't mm. go wrong with those. Just listen to a lot of music on them. and Yeah, and you get you to know, know them. You get get to know them. And like I said, man, they they really, really let you hear the mid-range in a way that a lot of other inexpensive speakers don't always necessarily do. And that's that's the important part that you want to be able to hear in detail when, when you mix them, you know? So. Yeah. And uh, if like yeah. these, the MTM ones with the arc thing, once you've calibrated them to the room... To the room, yeah. It's yeah. insane what they do. It really yeah. is. It's mad yeah. in the best I still, way. I still got to do that in my new room. I haven't done that in my new room yet, so... <laughs> yeah. And all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it comes um, with the mic and everything, so it's just, you know, get them out of the box, get them on the stands, get them plugged in, and then, yeah, just plug the mic in, set the mic up where you'd be sitting, and, and just go through the calibration process. Which is, and, uh, couldn't be simpler. That's the thing. Yeah. It's literally on the thing. Yeah, it's, it's on the dead speaker. simple. You just plug the mic into each speaker and, and use some of the buttons Hold on the, the button back down. to do it. Yeah. yeah. And it so. does the thing. And it's a bit freaky because the air mm-hmm. comes out right next to your hand when you're holding the button down. But they are fantastic. And I, I love them a lot. They're great. And it, yeah. that's the thing. You forget that your room isn't acoustically treated. Yeah. And obviously, like, yeah, you know, ideally you want to be in a treated room. But something like yeah. this, I think, gives you the best real world experience for not a big cash outlay obviously i'm not saying they're cheap but they're no. relatively inexpensive compared to what else is out there and what you get compared to general like, price range no. general like one. <laughs> yeah yeah and and that's and that's the thing it's like if you want to do this and get into producing music and hear it in a, a realistic way and make decisions in a realistic way to a way that a lot of people are going to hear stuff these monitors i think they're worth having oh absolutely Okay, IK Multimedia, yeah. you can send us a check now. Yeah, please do. It's those new ones. What mind a pair of those? Thank you. Um, yeah, just send us over some of the called? precisions to talk about as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about how amazing they are too, don't worry. Focus right as well. I've been using your stuff since 2014. Can I Can I have some stuff? Um, <laughs> can we work together? <laughs> Roland, can I have some replacement gear, please? <laughs> Roland, can we talk about accessibility? <laughs> <laughs> and preamps. <laughs> I'm a guitar player and I use one of the Boss multi effects unit, the, the GT1000. And, uh, oh, yeah. man, they could sort out some accessibility on that thing, but at <laughs> least it's accessible <laughs> to some extent, unlike the Helix. So, you know. Oh, the Helix, yeah. I've heard they're good. But, I've never seen one, but I've heard they're very good. Yeah, that's kind of the industry standard, but the GT1000 is like the Boss equivalent to it. And in a lot okay. of ways, I like it better. They have the GX100 now, which is more accessible especially with the, the ios app but okay you know it's, it's kind of the gt 1000s little brother in some ways in other ways yeah it's newer so it's got you know some newer stuff on there you mm. got your janelix and your ik multimedia mtm so those are your two pairs of monitors is there another yep. one or no no they're the ones i want to get like a little a consumer speaker like a little bose thing or something which i can have as a third one just to check because everybody's listening on those kind of things now, aren't they? So. Right, right. Yeah, I got a, I got a nice 2.1 system that I think I'm going to use as, as my alternate, like consumer check thing. Because that's, that's got like, oh, a nice. little sub and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah I can kind of at least check to see what it's going to do on a sub. I don't know that I'd necessarily want to mix with a sub. I know some people say you need one to hear the low end better, but nah. I feel like if you get the mid range right and and you know, check some low end on the headphones, make sure, you know, they're tight and there's nothing weird going on. You know, you yeah. check it on a sub, but I don't know if I'd want to mix on a sub per se, no. you know. <laughs> I mean, I mix primarily on the headphones, to be honest, because same, just to same. keep things flexible and because of my hearing loss as well. I don't know if that's influenced your decision to mix on the headphones. It definitely has me. You, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I think that when i started out you know like everybody tells you oh don't mix on headphones it's bad blah 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 use monitors yeah 
I had Yamaha HS8s, HS8, oh, HS8s, nice. whichever one's the first gen ones. I had a pair of those late 2000s was when I got those, and I had those mm. to like 2017, 18 when I just moved and just didn't have space for them anymore. Those were my monitors of choice, and they're not pretty to listen to by any stretch no, of I imagination. Can, I can agree with man, that. <laughs> you get stuff sounding right on there. And that was it. That That's to deal with Yamaha yeah. monitors, though, it seems, in general, like mm-hmm. that. Even, like, the NS10s. NS10s, to be the case. exactly. You know, they, they try to pass them off as a modern, you know, NS10. remake of the NS10s. They're not, but it's similar <laughs> in the sense that, for me, you know, if I got it sounding decent on there, I usually liked it on other stuff that I listened on. I've, I've heard... You know, one of my favorite mixers say that, you know, that's what drove him to get NS10 because he didn't like his translation on there. But, I mean, you know, I, I wasn't complaining about it either. But I also <laughs> didn't have NS10s on it I still never so. used it. We had them at school, in my secondary mm-hmm. school recording studio for a while. Mm-hmm. We had a pair of KRK Rocket 8s. probably. Yeah. The Rocket 8s, yeah, big, big speakers. Oh, those things will take your air off, man. Yeah, because I couldn't hear up there. I was fine. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you were fine. Everybody yeah, else was, was just like, well, all right, turn the treble <laughs> down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. For a while, we did have a pair of very, very battered NS10s, and then somebody blew one of the cones, so the NS10s then yeah. left. There and... those go. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we ended up getting a pair of Wharfdales, which is interesting because they were manufactured really locally, local to where I live. We had those for a while, you know, driven by an amp and all of that. And right. Then we had a little oh, so pair those of... were passive, those were passive. Yeah, passive. yeah. And then we had a little pair of Genos, mm-hmm. like computer speakers that looked a little bit like the iLoud MTMs, but a bit right. lesser quality. So I never really got to hear the NS10. I know we had them, and I know what they look like, roughly, but I never actually got to really hear them. The thing about mixing on speakers that I think a lot of people, and this is why it's really difficult, especially for, like, people coming up in a modern era where, you know, you listen to headphones a lot, probably. At the same time, like, the thing about working on on studio monitors is just, like, you really have to force yourself to use them, and you have to force yourself to just sit there and listen intently, because, you know, when headphones are on, like, it's a magnifying glass. You can hear everything. People with hearing loss as well, headphones... Mm -hmm. Because it just takes all the guesswork out because it brings everything closer, you know, which yes, for me exactly, definitely makes it easier. Exactly. For me, like, if I wanted to learn the lyrics to a song, I'd put headphones on, you know? Like, yeah, just, absolutely. Everything becomes clearer and easier to hear and all that, you know what I mean? Same here, yeah. I train myself. I, I put in the time and effort and energy and I train myself to use them. And then, like I said, I moved and it's in a smaller place for a little bit and... It was a roommate situation, so, you know, I wasn't on my own. I couldn't blast, you know, music at, like, 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock at midnight like I used to when I was working <laughs> on stuff after after hours, you know. Oh, no, really? They didn't like you turning your speakers all the way up and blasting mixes to hear the and, details? Exactly. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine why that would have bothered them when they had work the next day. <laughs> it's midnight. So. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, headphones kind of became a way of life, and, like, once I got out of the habit of using the monitors, I just could not get back into the habit. You know, it's like, yeah, do I want to put the time in to train myself again. And I just was like, you know what? Like stuff is getting decent and like my skills were still improving. So I'm just like, you know, like, yeah, don't don't get me wrong. You know, there's some unlistenable stuff I created, but I think I would have still let them on listenable, <laughs> even on speakers. Let's be yeah. honest. So I think I have know. my Genelex. Um, mm-hmm. I was looking after those even back in the Roland days. I Enough think said. that's the thing that people don't realize is you know good monitors like expensive microphones or expensive preamps or you know any of that stuff isn't gonna magically make your stuff sound better. You know, no. expensive plugins don't magically make your stuff sound better. It, different, yeah, you might like that flavor that it adds to your, your recordings more than another plugin, but the stuff has to reach a basic level of quality first. You know, yeah, you I mean? have to know what you're doing with it, regardless yeah. of how much yeah. it is. You have to be able to utilize it. I'm sure we'll get to plugins at some point. Yeah, oh, yeah. But, oh, yeah. but, but I, um, you know, for, yeah, for you both know what of you're us... Doing. With the hearing loss thing, I think like headphones just, and obviously you want you want to get like a, a a professional pair of headphones, you know, something that's relatively neutral, relatively uncolored. You know, it still comes down to personal taste. Like you know, some people might like 
the way AKGs or Sennheiser sound. You know, I personally am an Audio Technica person. Like that's just what I keep gravitating back towards after trying a bunch of heads. What I do is for sessions and for recording and stuff. If I'm going somewhere for sessions and it's not in a studio, I just finished a project where we were literally doing it out of a back room in a building so there was no equipment everything had to be provided by me so mm. it was headphones all the way i got a pair of audio technica 80h 50x's i discovered yeah, those at lead college music and never looked back love um, those. those are my favorite too ATH 50x's yeah. i do have a pair of akg k77's mm-hmm. don't really like them <laughs> yeah like they're my spare pair and they're usable i guess yeah. and they're closed yeah. back but I wouldn't want to listen to them myself for a long period of time to make other people wear them. Honestly, I mix on the Apple earpods. That is becoming more and more common. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing more and more mixers say they're doing that. There's this one guy, I'm blanking on his name. He does a a lot of the big rock stuff these days, and he's like, you know, 95% of his stuff, I saw a clip the other day, is headphones, and he says a good 60% of that is, is the earpods, you know? Yeah. For me, it's the wired ones. It's the ear, the ear pods, yeah. rather than the air. But yeah, um, I mean, you know, in effect, if you have like AirPod same. Maxes, use them wired. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Probably want to use, use something don't. wired. Also, they're well. Relic- if you do end up killing them, which I have done a few times, mm-hmm. you know, extreme EQ boost to try and find frequencies will might finish yeah. them off after a while. But yeah. <laughs> they're relatively easy to replace. Could you just right. order online? You know, they're not very expensive. They're, they're not like, very expensive. Whereas, so you can easily you just know. get another pair. Whereas, like, if I blow a pair of audio technicas, I would yeah. buy another pair, but it's going to be 100, what, 100 like pounds 100 or whatever. 100 pounds or something? <laughs> yeah, 150 maybe, you know. Yeah, It's, yeah. it's pricey. Whereas these, yeah, I'm burning through them potentially, but they sound good. I know what they sound like. I know what, you know, mm-hmm. if I get a new pair, I know it's going to sound like that. I listen yeah. to music on them all the time anyway. Yep. It makes the most sense to use them, you know. And and that's kind of the thing that I think, you know, to keep in mind too. Whichever pair of headphones you have right now, AirPods or any other kind of consumer thing, compare what you're working on to what other stuff sounds like on it. It may not be the most ideal thing, but you can make it work for now while you're getting started until you can afford an M50X or go grab a pair of earpods and get started that way. I'll mix on those um, because I genuinely don't think they're lacking in anything, you know, from what I can. I, I know what music sounds like on them. I know them, you know, really, really well. And for a while, I was using the Bose SoundSport, which were these wired in-ear headphones from Bose, and they were really, really nice. But whenever they broke... I had to buy a new pair, and they weren't cheap. So that was kind of the catch. It was basically like AirPods, but blown up, like, in sound. You know, they were just like AirPods, but the next step. They had the bow sound to them. Yeah. But like, Which, you know, the, mute yeah. some mids, boost the bass, boost the top, and there you go. <laughs> yeah, and it's quite nice when you get used to it. And I could mix on them, and it was fun. But when they broke, you had to buy a new pair, which was about £150, yeah. £200. And if I can't yeah. keep doing this. I just kept using the earpods and just kept using them because mm-hmm. you get a pair, you know what they're going to sound like, you can crack on, you know. Yeah. So that's what I mix on. Then I'll, I'll check them on the monitors and just make sure they're translating. This brings me to another question. Do you take your hearing aids out to use the earpods? Um, I do, yes. Yeah, yeah so you're not, you are not. don't have any of your hearing aid filter in when you're mixing, basically. No. Is, is well, I'll check it? them, though. I'll check the mixes with them because if you miss high frequency stuff, yeah, that's yeah. when and you're going to find That's it. the reason I, I don't want to use the ear pods. I don't want to take my hearing aids out because that's what's, you know, giving me back my high end, so to speak. You know, my, yeah. my clarity, yeah, same so here. to speak. Absolutely, yeah. same here. A little backstory, if if you're a Logic Band member, you're probably already aware of this, but like for the month of December, for a good chunk of the month of December, I had to go down hearing aids. Somehow they both magically broke at the same time. And Yay, that's nice. Holiday it? season, it took forever to get them back. Like I really didn't get up and running again until like mid-January. So from mid-December to mid-January, I was without my hearing aids, couldn't really do a lot of the stuff I had planned for Logic Band. That sent me back about a month, et cetera, et cetera. Still catching up on all that stuff now. 
but the thing is i tried to do some stuff and like you know i I tried like looking at like some guitar stuff because of course right after they broke is when i got my guitars back from the shop with some new pickups and stuff i had put in and all that and of course you know (laughs) i want to like timing you know compare (laughs) all this stuff and see if i made a good decision and whatnot and i don't have my hearing aids and all that i remember like going through and listening to them just like whatever like let me at least play them for a little bit you know and liking certain things about them and then when I got my hearing aids back and like going back through them again and like I, I made some like, you know, some some quick little dirty recordings just so I had a point of reference and I go back and reference, okay, this is how I felt the day of, how do I feel now hearing them properly, so to speak. The funny thing was I had a lot of the same exact feelings and opinions about them. It's just obviously without my hearing aids, I wasn't very confident in any of those things, whereas with them... Yeah, I still was. I, I was a lot more confident. Yeah. Now, like you said, you and me are kind of in the same vein. And I think it's going to be similar for a lot of people out there. The high end is what we're missing. You know, like the yeah. the, the things that make everything sound clear and understandable and whatnot. Because, you know, same yeah. thing with vocals and, and someone speaking. A lot of that's going to be in the upper mid range and yes. the top end. You know, that, that helps us hear it. Roll off all the bass on the vocals. That's, you know, you can still understand <laughs> it. Roll off all the top yeah. end. Nope. like charlie brown that's that what it sounds like for us yeah <laughs> minus you know. hearing it <laughs> exactly that, that, that's what it's like for us when like someone's talking to us from the other room and we're just like yeah um, you're gonna oh, have to like come next to me sorry <laughs> it's like you said about lyrics earlier mm-hmm. if i have headphones on and i'm looking into something or the earpods in mm-hmm. i might be able to make out some lyrics without yeah. with, with just the speaker or without my hearing aids in on the speakers, forget, forget it. it. Yeah, yeah, forget it. And even even and conversation is hard. Like without yeah, having headphones, this, like this now struggle. this this is yeah. fine because I don't have my hearing aid in, but I've got headphones in, headphones so I can hear in, you. Yeah. And it's direct, you know. But mm. if we were just sat in a room now and I had my hearing aid out, well, we're going to be so close, we might as well be making out. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just to understand <laughs> each other. <laughs> Absolutely that. So, you know, like just just to give some perspective, it's like it's one of those things where like. It was interesting to see that, like, I made a lot of the same decisions without it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that was, like, a really kind of learning moment for me to realize that at the end of the day, a good sound is a good sound is a good sound. You know what I mean? Like, your, your hearing has to be severely, severely mangled. For for you to not be able to determine whether something is a good sound or not, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm just talking like you know a piano patch or a guitar distortion or something like that. You you're, you're probably gonna like that sound with or without your hearing aids, you know, if you're yeah. someone that's that's hearing impaired as well. You know, yeah. you're, you're probably gonna if you can hear it loud enough, you, you're probably gonna like that sound. And it was kind of this eye opening thing. It's the same thing where people are like. You know, we as as audio people, we I'm sure you've watched your fair share of YouTube comparisons about plugins or microphones or preamps Mike, yeah. or whatever. And it's yeah, like, absolutely. oh yeah, you know, on YouTube, you know, you may not be able to tell the how I've how never understood that ever. Is and <laughs> YouTube compression. So down, download the raw tracks and throw it in your DAW and listen for yourself. And I'll put a it like, in HD if I really like it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm just like, yeah, but if like if you like it over YouTube, you're going to like it in the room. <laughs> if you can't hear a difference over YouTube, you're probably not really going to hear that difference when you throw those tracks in your DAW. Unless no. you really start nitpicking, you know? <laughs> I can like, hear a slight oh, boot at 10k. Yeah, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, I guess that one's a little. It's a zero point uh, three dB increase. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and like that's the thing with like guitar pickups for me is like every time I watch a guitar pickup shootout, so the guitars, oh yeah, there is a difference. Put it in the mix. Oh, I can't tell which guitar is which. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's and, another thing as well. It's like nameplates. Yeah. Once you once you know what something is. Yeah. And you go, oh, yeah. But, like, that's obviously. the interesting thing. Even when you know which one is which, like, good luck picking them out sometimes. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. But then people and, get so attached to that as well yeah. because it's like, you say, oh, it's whatever brand. Then they go, oh, yeah, you can tell. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. yeah. Okay, like, if you didn't know that, you wouldn't be able to. Exactly. <laughs> I heard a story once of someone who, I can't remember the details of it, but I'll, I'll paraphrase. 
they had an amp. It was a Behringer amp or pedal or something. Yeah. And yeah. they took the Behringer logo off it and put like a Bosch logo on it. And everybody came up to the Mac of the show and said how amazing it sounded. Mm-hmm. And if like with the Behringer logo on it, would they have said that? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the thing a lot of people don't realize, especially with, you know, Behringer is a company that's known. They they built the company and the reputation on making inexpensive knockoffs of other people's products. Oh, you know yeah. I mean? The thing is, like, when you talk about things like guitar pedals or mixers or analog things, you know, mm. these circuits aren't secrets anymore. You know, like, no. a Tube Screamer is not a secret circuit. A, a, a Boss DS1 is not a secret circuit. You know, a lot of companies have taken these circuits and modified them and made, you know, Joe Smo's distortion pedal. Anything analog. Now, are some of those mixers a little noisy? Sure, I'm not going to say they're not, you know. No, I got but, one. Of a, did you think Behringer gets the reputation of being cheap and absolutely terrible build quality and, you yeah. know, bricks? I've had a Behringer 12 or 4 since 2015 and it still works right. perfectly. And, so. and that's the other thing, too. I think people got to remember Behringer of pre, say, X32 versus mm-hmm. Behringer post X32 are two different companies quality wise. You know what I mean? I mean everybody loved the X32. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And and that that was kinda like the first real product they made where people were like, oh, this might actually be something I would use in a professional setting on a day to day basis, et cetera, et cetera. You and know, people so like, yeah. post post X thirty two, like their their build quality and all that stuff kinda changed. So like, you know, post like say twenty eleven, twenty twelve time frame Behringer, you know, like they they have some original stuff now, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I'm I'm I like their UMC stuff. It's kind of their competitors to the Scarlet, and yeah. you get much more bang for buck over the Scarlet on a price perspective. And well, yeah, like that. Their eight quality. channel pre is quite cheap, isn't it? Yeah, their eight channel know. interface. Yeah. That being said, like, are the mic pre's great? Yeah, you can record. They're gonna sound clean and clear and transparent, but. They're not going to be colored like, say, a Neve or an SSL emulation might be. Yeah, but yeah. they're neither a, a Scarlet ones, really. Exactly. They're, exactly. they're going to be different, but they're not going to be, yeah, they're not going to be yeah. Neve or SSL types, you know. To compare preamps at, like, you know, that sub two to $300 price range, it's like we're talking about, like, good luck telling the difference. Like, is there going to be a difference? Sure. But it's like, do you like... What what brand of vanilla ice cream do you like at that point? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's vanilla. Like, it's gonna, two, van, two companies making vanilla ice cream are going to be slightly different, but it's still yeah. vanilla ice cream. But still, you can still tell it's vanilla ice cream the first time you taste it. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And you're not going to be slightly like, oh, different. this yeah. company's vanilla ice cream tastes weird. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's kind of oh. how I look at it. Like, until you get into, like, high-end mic pre's, which, by the way, don't. <laughs> how can I say? Yeah. Don't bother. <laughs> Until you get into high end mic pre's, you're not really going to know so much of a difference. Now, it, it, mic pre's <laughs> have like, everything, but it's like the last thing to get into. Like, upgrade your monitors, upgrade your headphones, upgrade, upgrade your, your mics. Your you know. mics. Yeah, you know. Like, that's the stuff that's going to make a big difference. A mic pre is such a minute difference at the end of the day. Yeah, like, there so are Your converters but... are good and the pre's good. <laughs> Just get a good microphone. Get a microphone you like the sound of. You know. Yeah, get like a Scarlet or even a Behringer potentially. That yeah. sound it's not gonna sound like my old Roland. And yeah, yeah. you know, with a nice any, clean any, pre. Any interface a hundred dollars or more these days, unless you're talking like yeah. Behringer UMC two oh two, which might be back down to like eighty nine bucks or something like that. You know, like once you kinda cross the hundred dollar mark you say, really? audio, yeah. the audience evo stuff you know like that stuff is amazing for the price Apogee, a plastically, um, you know as yeah, far as like the bill quality goes but it's amazing for the price but the pre's still good the yeah, pre's the pre are excellent by. you know the behringer pre's you know plenty of people use them and get professional work done every day same with the scarlet don't get hung up on that just kind of find find something that you know the price works for you it's got features you want like do you want like five pin midi io okay find something with that if you don't then then don't you know do you um, want eight channels or you want six or two, two or... headphone jacks no then don't worry about it you do find something that's got two headphone jacks on there do you want you know? more than two headphone jack while you're out of a look of air <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Yeah, Buy a you're headphone gonna have to get amp. some specialty <laughs> stuff there. Get a headphone amp, but yeah, so, or an audio you know, Nero. <laughs> I, I think that's the thing that we've learned um, doing this is like where we are in 2023. The inexpensive stuff 
doesn't suck. And no, it's good. And you it's not very. worth. Yeah, it's not worth kind of comparing inexpensive stuff. On that note, what I will say is, is, that, is that I did a session, and this is going to cause outrage in the comments, but <laughs> I'll say it anyway, because I think it's a good point. I did a session at my university, I think it was last year or the year before, the signal chain was a Neumann U87 into a SSL, I forget the actual console, but it was an SSL console, you know, big format thing. We recorded it, I took the vocals home to mix them in with the track that I was doing at home, did the mix at home. And I remember pulling it up and going, is that it? I was a bit, I was expecting something more and I don't know what I was expecting, but because... Folklore. Yeah, because it's like the U87 is a really expensive mic. The SSL is a really expensive pre. I was expecting something really... Magical. Magical. And I just went, this to me sounds exactly the same as my Rode NT1A into my Scarlet. Yeah. You know. And, and... Not bad sure, at all. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure if you put the two side by side, you'd hear some differences. <laughs> yeah. But could you make that Rode NT1 into a Scarlet work in a mix? And Absolutely. put it out professionally? Exactly. Absolutely. You know, and, and that's the thing that, like, right now you're on an SM7B. I'm on the Electro Voice RE320. Similar yep. microphones, you know. Very, yeah. But at the end of the day, like, you know, I like the 320 sound. Everybody, including you, like the SM7B sound. Yep. Look, it's if nice I mic. didn't have my free 20 and I walked in and like, oh, we have it in SM7B, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> well, know? no, it's a good mic, you know. Yeah. Uh, just and... remember to get a pet head with it or a cloud lifter. Well, I don't even know if you really need those these days. Like, I find I, everything... I definitely do. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're using your Mackie. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think most modern... And that's, that's an older... Interfaces unit, uh... could probably do it, yeah. Yeah, most modern interfaces have enough clean gain on tap, like... Trust me, going You're back going to like the time yeah. we were talking about, man, you got some of those, you know, inexpensive, you know, like Scarlet and other cheap interfaces like that. Roland. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you, you get them past free My quarter the way just... up and it's just like, shh. <laughs> My Roland wouldn't have stood a chance with the SM7B. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, yeah, but I think these days, pretty much every inexpensive thing I've plugged these things into, they seem to have enough gain on tap. One of the reasons I like the Pre-20 is it has a higher output and there's a little bit more top-end clarity to it, you know. Mm. Um, the SM7B can be a relatively darker sounding microphone. Yeah, but and it's quieter. It also can be, it's, yeah, it's quieter and it's, you got to get right up on that thing, man. That thing's going to be in your yeah, face. Yeah, you have. You know, um, <laughs> so... Yeah, you know, but it's it's like, but this is the type of thing I'm talking about where, like, you know, find something that works for you or grab an industry standard, grab an SM7B or try the free 20, you know. It's a similar bracket, you know. Yeah, you, could, yeah. you could see them, they'd be on the same shelf kind of thing. A exactly, know? exactly. The thing is, like, once you enter, like, a certain basic level of professionalism, diminishing returns, you know. I like the SM7B better than an SM57, but I could make a record with an SM57, or rather, I could record a vocal, yeah. or mic up a guitar cab, or you know, whatever. Or I could, I could use an SM57 yeah. or 58, no problem. With anything, pretty much. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But I like the SM7B better, you know. Yeah. So give me a choice. I'm going to get an SM7B now. Give me a choice of an SM7B or say a Neumann TLM103. I'm probably still going to pick the SM7B, but that's just, yeah. You know, but that's also like, based on the environment as well, because exactly if, if it'll be wasted nice, on us at the moment. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. If if you're in a nice treated studio and you're recording a quiet, delicate female voice, then okay, maybe detail on would be a better fit. But you know, yeah. it's like you're gonna get something you can use all the time once you hit that two to you know four hundred dollar price point on microphones. You can yeah. go above it. You might like it better, but you really once you go about five hundred dollars, I find it's like diminishing returns. So like you know, if you can find yeah. something in that three hundred dollar range that you like, that's um, kind of the sweet spot almost. That's you the know, sweet spot, affordable think, you know. and also professional yeah. kind of thing. You know, You're right? The TLM one hundred three. I think mm -hmm. I remember reading an article with Phineas. He produces all the Billy Alex's stuff. I remember him saying that you know now he has a TLM one hundred three, but yeah. all of the that's hits. That's not what our stuff was recorded on. No. Like, we, I have one now, but all our hits that we did before that, which went absolutely insane, was an Audio-Technica AT2020. 2020, yep. Yeah. 
which is a, what, $100? $200? Yeah, yeah. $220? Yeah, hundred dollars or something. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it works. We both know someone that uses a 2020 USB. Yes. And we've never complained about her vocals ever. So. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no. so I prefer dynamic mics personally. And it's I just... think for our situation, that's yeah. understandable as well, because it's exactly. that. Yeah, you know. you know, like in an untreated room, you have just a lot more issues to deal with a condenser like the AT2020. Can you make yeah. it work? Yeah, sure. You know, God, but yeah, well, okay. we know someone that does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I've heard the multi-track, so, you know. Me too. Like, I can hear the room bleed, but, you know, you throw the instruments up and you don't really hear the room on bleed. It, you know, <laughs> right. that's fine. Maybe a bit of Wave Clarity VX, which is bought like a $29 plug-in because Wave yeah. had a sale on every couple of seconds, I think. Don't worry. If you missed the sale, it'll be on sale again tomorrow. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be, don't worry. If you missed the sale... <sighs> Now it's back. Go. Yeah. Just to wrap up, don't get discouraged by the hearing if that's if that's also an issue for you. Because oh yeah, if something sounds good to you and someone else thinks it also sounds good, I think that's a good sign that you can roll with it and you can you can do something with it. Now, where it gets tricky is figuring out how to make sure you're not missing anything like as far as like if we're missing top end per se we're both missing some of the high end when we don't have our hearing aids in yeah so absolutely you say you're you're using ear pods and you're not using your hearing aids when you're working for 90 percent of it yeah yeah because then yeah. i but then i will pop the monitors up and check them on my hearing aids as well just right. to make absolutely and to be honest Ninety nine percent of the time I've done fine. I've sent mixes to clients and they've gone, Yeah, that's fine. You know. Right. And I thought if there's anything wrong with the high end, they're gonna spot it and go, Oh, can we do something about that? And then yeah. I'd have to hunt it down, but I've never really had that. And this is the thing, on a personal level, I was quite nervous about well, kind of a bit anxious about I wouldn't be able to get clients, you know, paid clients mm -hmm. because of my hearing loss. Because I thought, hang on a minute, I'm missing High frequency. I can't. I can't mix and charge people yeah. for that. Who's gonna pay for a probably deaf person to mix their stuff? Mm -hmm. But I can do it, and you know, I, I, I never, you know, my first client, I did it, and you know, they were happy with it, and they paid me, and that was that. And it's like, oh, I can actually do this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is it is great, and people continue to do it, and you know. You can check out my website and see the portfolio, it's there. So, yeah, it's right. <laughs> you know, and the testimonials are there and everybody's really happy with the results. So, it's like you said earlier, if it sounds good, it sounds good. And just because you can't hear part of it, you know, the high frequencies. If you already think it sounds good with just the low end and mid range or whatever, what you can hear probably is, probably is fine. Yeah. And, and it goes back to what I said earlier. Remember, the meat of everything we hear that we enjoy is the mid-range. And if you exactly. can hear enough of that, you're going to get a good, a very, very good sense. Of, Which we both can, right? We can right, both hear yeah, pretty well yeah, there. You know, so. so you're going to get a very, very good sense of what is going on and how it sounds and what it might possibly sound like. There are two things I kind of want to dive into. I, obviously, mm. I want to hear about your workflow without the yep. hearing aids but talk let's talk a little bit about how you overcame going out and getting clients and charging and working when yeah. you didn't feel like it was something you could do or dare i say you didn't feel like it was something you had the right to be doing yeah as someone with a hearing loss you know like, yeah I mean, how, how did you overcome that I think it was just about, I started posting things in like whatsapp groups and things like that and you know doing things just for myself, you know, things that I've composed or whatever it might be. Just things that I've, I've done, really. I'm posting them and people were saying, you know, these mixes are really good. Like, oh, okay, thank you. You know, and then I remember just somebody recommended me to someone. I won't name names, but someone recommended me and went, oh, you should get Louis to mix this. He's really good. You should get him to mix it. And then when I was talking to that person, they said, oh, can you, can you mix this? And I was like, yeah, of course. Then they said, multi tracks over and they went, oh, yeah, how much do you charge? And I went, oh, um, okay. And then I pick a number, pick a number, pick a <laughs> yeah, number. Pick a number. Make it scare them off. <laughs> make it good. And I asked, you know, I asked advice of, of different people. I went, how much do you think I should? And eventually, I settled on the price and mm. told them that, and they went, yeah, that's fine. That was the moment really that made me think, I can do this. When they just went, yeah, that's fine. I'm happy to pay that. Sounds good. And they'd heard my mixes, 
and they were happy to pay for them. And I went, oh, okay, this is this is doable. And I did the mix, and they went, can you just turn the vocal down a little bit? And then bring the reverb up a little bit at the end. And it's like, yeah, I'll go in and do that. Okay, yeah, that's it. That's great. Thank you. Do you want to invoice me? It's like, okay, wow. Um, and, I, I, and I think thing. the important, I think the important thing to take away from what you just said there too is those changes they ask for in the end is typical mix revisions. You know, yes, yeah. not any, all any, that's really bright. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Like every mixer, you know, any I'm talking professionals on the commercially release for a major label level. Yeah, literally get, anyone get notes like literally. that. Literally, yeah, literally get notes. Yeah, like, can you bring the vocals down a little bit. Can it's a little too dry? Can I get a little bit more reverb? You know, immediately your your first feedback is stereotypical feedback that people have yeah. when you're working under their music. You know, which was a big so, confidence boost as well because it was like, yeah, yeah, this is perfectly reasonable feedback. It's not feedback because of my impairment, it's just mm-hmm. mixed feedback. Yeah, it's um, feedback because of your taste and their taste just yeah. misaligning slightly, which is normal. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's the first mix, it's very rarely going to be spot on the first time around. I've well, had it happen. Ex- but, well, you know, it, it's, it's really going to be spot on to exactly what they were expecting the first time around. Yeah, yeah. like I said, I sometimes get, oh, it's a little bit, that symbol's a bit bright. And I have to, I have to work with that and work around yeah. that and go, okay, how are we going to do this? And at that point, yeah. the hearing aids come out and the speakers come on, and you know, you work with that. But most of the time, it, it's fine. You know, nobody complains about mm-hmm. the high end. It, it, the funny thing is, you mentioned the crash or whatever. I have a mix of one of my songs that I actually didn't mix. I recorded it and everything, and you know, it's just I had a lot going on, and someone else who was, you know, kind of like, like you said, getting her hands dirty with mixing and whatnot and mixed it for me i wouldn't say perfect hearing because who really has perfect hearing but you know really good hearing to the point where it's like sometimes i think they had bionic hearing basically you know what I mean? <laughs> there's no no hearing aids no loss you know like no hear a screaming child three blocks away and wonder <laughs> why they're not feeding their kid and you're just going what what are you talking about you know <laughs> so like yeah one of these people they mixed it right and yeah. years later an engineer I admire was offering some mastering at you know like a discounted rate and i was like yeah. you know what let me get this song mastered it's, it's mixed let me get okay, it mastered, mastered and I, said, yeah. I sent it off to them to get it mastered and their feedback was wow that hi-hat's loud don't you want to turn it down <laughs> and i'm just like no i kind of like it there it's like you sure I because i can't hear it being intrusive so <laughs> yeah but like i didn't make that decision you know so it's like yeah but you like, also couldn't hear it i guess well I, I could i could hear it but i liked it that way because it was one of those things where it was it was kind of like a accounting almost yeah but it was like a breakdown in the song where like everything but one guitar dropped out so it's like one guitar and a hi-hat and the hi-hat's on one side you know because if you stereo mic a drum kit the hi-hat's easily off to yeah. like the left you know and the guitar is all the way on the right basically mm. and so it's like you basically <coughs> just have the hi-hat and guitar and i i liked it because like over the the big heavy guitar you know you kind of hear the hi-hat counting into where everything drops back in you know um yeah, kind of into so that worked. drum fill that leads yeah. and everything dropped back in so i i liked it and they're just like, oh, it's a little loud, you know. You should you should bring it down. And I'm like, eh, I kind of like it that way. And I think he ended mm. up, you know, mastering it with, with it at that level. Yeah. But you know, anyway, I, I went into this long diatribe to say that it's taste at the end of the day, and like other people are gonna make similar decisions. Even with the hi hat being too loud, may not have necessarily been a hearing aid thing in that situation. You know, like there's there yeah. another person who mixed a song of mine, and my feedback was literally like. It sounds great. Drums are too loud, you know. Can you bring all of those down and then that'll be it? <laughs> yeah. And, and the funny yeah. thing was, like, I'm I'm following them on Twitter, and like after after I got my mix revision back, I saw them tweet, "Drums are too loud." That's always the feedback I get. I guess I need to stop <laughs> mixing my drums so loud. <laughs> so, you know, same situation. Someone with you know good hearing, no hearing loss, and those are the decisions they're making. So I think yeah, sometimes too, the same kind of feedback. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, so that like, that was it was a massive confidence boost for me just getting mm-hmm. that kind of feedback and not 
you know, and even now, like I said, I'm really getting comics on the high end. It just it seems yeah. to be all in order. What I want to bring home again is yeah. get the mid range right, and if everything sounds great there, chances are the base and high end will fall in line. Yeah, as well. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So yeah. That's that's why I keep saying that because that's that's what Louis discovered. That's what I've discovered. And there's a reason why people still like mixing on NS10s and Oratones. Yeah. Because that's all it really lets you hear is the mid range. You know? And if it sounds good on those, it's definitely going to sound good in other places. You know? Yeah. yeah. You know? And like you said, you know, put in the hearing aids and check on something where you can hear the top end, where you can hear the low end. And Just like any other mixer it. would do. Check on yeah. various systems, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Compare it to, you know, other songs that you like the sound of and go from there. So. Yeah, you gotta get to know it. You gotta get to know like what the songs you really like sound like on your monitor with your hearing aids in. You know, you gotta learn how that sounds because maybe your hearing aids make things overly bright or your monitors make things overly bright, and that's mm-hmm. normal. Mm-hmm. So if you listen to a mix of yours and you think it's too bright, probably not. If, if other if, things are if as well, it sounds similar in brightness to yeah your reference material. Then you know that it's it's not too bright or. Whereas if, if you, your if you kick just, sounds thin and theirs doesn't, then you might need to boost your, your kick. Yeah, the but it, it, you it's know. key to use references, if not during the mix, if you know, mm-hmm. if not being able to get to know what that sounds like with hearing aids and the speakers and everything, get to know that sound so that then you know, oh, I can actually get away with making it a little bit more brighter because it's not actually that much brighter, it just sounds it. So I can actually get away with doing that. Because without that, you'll just be chopping out brightness and now it sounds too yeah. dark everywhere else <laughs> exactly <laughs> and and this by the way is something everybody struggles with when learning a new pair of speakers headphones oh yeah or whatever absolutely you know. a lot of our struggles are, are still very much in line let's talk about you know you take your hearing aids out you put your ear pods in and you start mixing you know tell me a little bit more about that process and let's talk about the tools we like to use the toys hey. we like to play with <laughs> yeah the fun stuff. Plug in Alliance. Plug in Alliance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, they're, they're a bit like waves, but they don't have tails on half as often, but they're still fairly regular. They're like waves, except, you know, they have sales once a week instead of on Seven every days day a week. that ends with Y. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I say this, we, we say this as owners of waves plugins. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> if you thought complete control was an addiction, avoid waves. Mm. Plug in the lines. I, I, you know, the brain work stuff, like the brain work consoles, use those on pretty much every mix. Mostly the yeah. Neve. Oh, I uh, love man. I, the Neve you know is glorious. If you're a Neve person, because I'm, I'm the same way. I'm a Neve person, too. Mm. The BX9099. Oh, the Amec, whatever Amec, it's called. Amec, be it nine It's like a modern it's, Neve, isn't it? It's a modern Neve. It's like one of the last like big consoles I think Rupert designed. Uh, okay. From like the late 90s, I want to say. Yeah, um, I think it's like 90, early 2000s, something like that. Because it's got yeah, digital yeah, yeah, elements yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I do I'm have similar it. similar to you, where I generally tend to prefer the sound of Neves over SSLs. Yeah, SSL uh, for certain things, like for denser yeah. things, I feel like it does things to SSL. When you say denser things, give me an example of what you mean by denser things. Like, I don't know, like more rocky stuff where there's more layers and guitars and stuff. I feel so like the SSL is more thing. suited to that. I still kind of like news on some of that stuff. Oh, by default, absolutely. But I feel yeah, like with an yeah. SSL, it does something particularly well with those kind it of does, mixes it does, for me. It does. And, and that's why so many of that stuff... People are using SSL 4000s, you know, ERGs yeah. on those, you know. Yeah, which but, we have in plugin form, officially licensed. Exactly. <laughs> which is nice. For whatever that's worth. <laughs> yeah, rather than it being like a, an, some kind of a butchered name that still basically means SSL, but we can't say it for yeah. legal reasons. They're always hilarious, aren't they? Seeing people's for reworking collection. of names. They are fun. Console G. Hmm. <laughs> console E. Yeah, console J. It's soon to have console, console J. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where you do this long enough and you start to be able to decipher the code, like case in point. Fat compressor is used on 1176. I'm going to say just... Some kind. <laughs> Opto compressor, you know, that's, an, that's an LA2A. That's usually an LA2A. Um... <laughs> yep. So, you know, it's, it's, 
It's, it's, it's just glue one of compressor. Things. Glue <laughs> compressor is usually an SSL. Yep. Um, what's the other SSL one? Uh, VCA, uh, classic VCA or vintage oh, VCA. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Log- yeah, Logic yeah. Compressor calls it vintage VCA because the classic VCA, I think, is a DBX. But yeah, it is. Usually, when you see like VCA, glue, bus comp, that's usually an SSL. If they say VCA in something like 160, then that would be the DBX. And then the focus yeah. right one is red. So if we see anything. I'm going to say red. red VCA, it's always that. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, Unless so, it's waves, you know. in which case it's something else entirely. <laughs> yeah. But most most of those will help you kind of decipher the code of plugins when they can't use the official license name without being sued. You know, I do find it. Um, I just find it amusing. Not because yeah. it's not to make up other than, but I just find it funny, like how they try to make it obvious but not obvious. Yeah. Uh, well, someone just did an amp sim for like Orange Amps, a uh, UK guitar oh, yeah. amp company. Yeah. Um, and like all their amps are orange and everything. And they're like, the tagline was, get your vitamin C. And I'm just like, oh, okay, it's an orange <laughs> clone. <laughs> Play so, on words. Know, Puns are good, yeah, aren't they? They get pretty creative with some of these names. You like a lot of the, the plug-in alliance stuff, which that I is, do. That is my company of choice. So you're using the, the console Neve, the console N. Yeah, the console N is on my mix bus for like 90% of mixes, okay. followed by drop tubes tape. That's a beautiful I thing. I just got that, and I need it's to great. play with it some more. Yeah. Put it on the mix bus. It's beautiful. What I've been doing recently, actually, is following that up with mm-hmm. the Waves IM Pusher. Infected oh, Mushroom Pusher. Infected Mushroom Pusher. Okay. I don't know what on earth that thing does, but it makes it sound better. That's all I'll say. Right. <laughs> That's the Make It Sound Better button. It is. It literally is. Like, if I'm doing a mix, and I feel like it's just not quite getting there... And I've exhausted all of the possibility. They go, right, time to get that out again. Right, and it, right. 90% of the time just makes everything sound nice. I don't know what it does, but it just mm-hmm. makes it sound like hi-fi. It's great. It's kind of like, you know, when you put the Logic console EQ on stuff and it has that kind of thick, glossy sound? Well, you know why we like that, right? Yeah, it's a new thing. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but it kind of does that. Does the wave, but it also does a bit yeah. of EQ under the hood, but I don't know what right, exactly right. it's doing. It just really I think good. that's what I like about Neve. They have this glossy top end to them. It's you know? really nice. Yeah. yeah, I really like just boosting the top end and like the bottom is warm and yeah. fat sounding. You know, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> SSL is kind of like this mid range kind of crunchiness to them. That's what I mean. And it works yeah, really don't, well. Don't, like don't take crunchiness as a bad thing, people. That's not what. No, I mean. no, no. For certain yeah. things, it's just glorious, and the compression yeah. as well is just. Great. Yeah, for me, 90% of it is Neve. My EQ of choice? Actually, Logic Stock. So the channel EQ, channel like 99% EQ of is stuff. It is. It just does what it needs to do, yeah. and it does it well. And the Vintage Console EQ, and I'll just switch out, like, you know, the different output modes that it has. I'll just switch between yeah. those and whatever one sounds better I'll go with. Most of the right, time, right. it's the Smooth one, which is the Neve. Uh, which one? <laughs> the Smooth is the 2 EQ, isn't it? Uh, the vintage console EQ, yeah, you, and it, but you can basically have the vintage console. Oh, EQ no, 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 I know, I know that, but I'm saying the output smooth is the is the. Oh yeah, it is the tube EQ, yeah, which yeah, I think yeah, yeah. is a Neve, I think. No, I think the, like the, the tube EQ is a Poltec. Is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a Poltec. Yep. It's and then a, it pumps you like an API. I want to say API, which is the graphic EQ. Yeah, the graphic yes. EQ is an API. The and then the console EQ is a Neve. Is the tube EQ is a Poltec and the console? Yeah. Is a Neve. Yep. Yeah, so normally it's the, it's the smooth for me that I use most mm-hmm. of the time. And I use the console EQ because I prefer that kind of layout and that kind of yeah, way of working. Yeah. Really simple, you know. It's dead simple, um, yeah. I don't often really EQ with it much. It, I just put it on for the sound. Sometimes I will EQ on it for like broader strokes. Console yeah, it's, EQ it's a very style. broad stroke thing. What I will do is I'll put it on and just kind of bring up the top end a little bit. Because like I said, I just kind of like how... It enhances <laughs> stuff there. You yeah. put that across all your tracks, you really want to use a little of it because you take your head off if you're not careful. Don't overcook it at all. The nice thing, though, about it is you put it on a source where you really need to push it. You can definitely push the analog emulations a little bit further than the digital stuff, like the channel EQ and the linear EQ, yeah. just like transparent digital EQs. They don't have a sound in them or anything. The vintage EQ collection does. That's what it like is, yeah. You can push them a little further. They're emulating analog saturation when they really get pushed as opposed to digital noise. <laughs> <laughs> and it, sounds, it just sounds glorious. 
It's yeah. the only way to describe it. Go and try that when you're finished here, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Like, like take <laughs> take the channel EQ and like let's say set the high shelf to twelve kilohertz yep. and boost it. Boost it by like you know ten. You know something mm. crazy, and then do the same thing with the high band in the vintage console EQ. And I think even if you're hearing impaired, you're still gonna notice yeah something going on there. Talk to me about your journey with compression, especially with hearing aids without uh-huh. hearing aids like because that's i feel like that's one of the hardest things to learn and it is i'm gonna be I'm honest still not with really you, <laughs> i feel like the logic stock compressor is a better compressor to start with than some other dw stock compressors because they're so clean and subtle that like it makes it really difficult to hear when it's really working you know what I yeah mean? well logic uh, can do that but you can also do can. other things <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think switching the logic compressor to one of the vintage emulations, at least just to kind of hear the compressor working and hear what it's doing. And let's be honest, have you ever picked Platinum Digital as your final option when using Very the Very rarely, if ever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So. It's often the next one down, which I forget, because I'll often just the go through without PCA. really listening. Yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. just go through without really listening, and whatever one sounds nicer, I'll go with, but I don't bother right, remembering right. which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> what was getting to grips with compression like for you? I don't think I'm still kind of there. So I still struggle with the whole attack and release thing. Yeah, like, I just yeah. can't quite get my head around it. So what I tend to do is, sort of going to specifics a bit, is the logic compressor I'll often use as my parallel. Yeah. So I'll smash the crap out of a sound with that. When the mix is all the way up at 100% and you've got that really squashed signal, mm-hmm. that's when I'll start going through and listening to the different circuits and going, which one do I like the sound of? Mm-hmm. okay that one and then i'll dial it back yeah. and then that'll be my okay. parallel that's kind of how i do that for normal kind of less extreme compression mm-hmm. i'll use the native instruments and soft tube vintage compressors i love those a lot the vc76 that might be an 1176 yeah, yeah i'm pretty sure it is yeah. for legal reasons it might not be which by the way is the fet options in the logic compressor <laughs> Yeah. The Logic Compressor has got two different 1176 versions in there. Oh, yeah, it has. It's got, like, the yeah. silver face and the other one. Yeah. But it's kind of more extreme stuff, but not as extreme as Parallel. It's the VC76. For sort of more everyday stuff, it's the VC2A in limiter mode. Glorious. Yeah. Oh, I love the la 2 a Yeah, And that's the great. optical option in the Logic Compressor, by the way. Yeah, the bottom one. Yeah. There's like this clarity to opto and like this smoothness to the to opto compression. There's no attack or release time really to worry about. Exactly, that's what drew me to it. That's what drew me to it really. You just turn it up or you turn it down. (laughs) Exactly. You just you adjust the the gain going into the compressor and it it does its thing and you just find where you like what it's doing and Yeah. Or do do you want it in compressor or limit mode, you know? Which one do you like? I use that for side chaining as well quite a lot because again it's just so simple. It pumps it it, it pumps in time a little better, you find. Yep. And it's just simpler. I gotta try that. I gotta try it. Now the the native instrument vintage collection is something you have access to as a complete control user they uh, also do an ssl thing called the solid bus comp yeah which yeah, i used to use a lot i don't use that one my roommate uses it a lot so i've yeah. watched it being used many times i've been in the room while while they were using it on their bus and all that i like it but we've know. got the plug in alliance ones so yeah the, the <laughs> townhouse oh yeah the they townhouse. just got townhouse i'm looking forward to seeing what they think of townhouse versus solid bus comp I need to try Townhouse versus Solid Bus yeah. Comp. I need to do that. I do have it. I just haven't really mm-hmm. played with it because the SSL and Neves keep calling to me. So this technically an SSL. It's just the Townhouse Studio didn't have an SSL. They had an SSL console, but they didn't have the compressor, and they had all the SSL parts that SSL uses for the compressor. <laughs> so they just made one themselves. <laughs> Love and that. So like because they made different. it, they kind of tuned it to their own ears, and it's yeah. so slightly different from the stereotypical SSL, but it's, it's essentially yeah. an SSL bus car. And the, the townhouse, by the way, for anybody going, I haven't heard of a townhouse. You have. It's where In the Air Tonight was recorded. Yeah. So, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's responsible for that drum sound. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, that, that and the talkback mic. <laughs> yeah, the talkback mic and the, the ball and biscuit talkback mic from... It's a cold, right? So, yeah. yeah. Reverb and delay. Reverb, Valhalla, vintage. I don't know why I never got into the Valhalla stuff. I like 
that that free one super massive super massive is cool never really but, played with it like i played with it for a bit when it came out and it went, eh, yeah. fair enough the thing about it is like you have to be into like design and stuff to make it work for you what i like about it is it's one of those delays that can give you color delays to make it sound more reverby mm. and they have presets in there that kind of are like you know very very reverb-esque part of the reason that i just never got around to getting into valhalla stuff as good as they are is I just don't use a lot of reverbs, like other than like, you know, obviously <laughs> like your snare, some of, you know, the other drums, like the overheads and stuff like that. Maybe like super clean guitars or back and vocals. Like other than that, I really don't use reverbs, you know, it's just yeah. one of those things I never really got into in that regard. And, you know, the Logic, you know, Space Designer and Chroma Verb are just ridiculous for stock reverbs that, you know, like if I'm in yeah. a, if, if I need to get something done quickly. I'm Chroma probably verb. Just gonna pull those up, you know. I love Chroma Verb. Got a lot yeah. of time for Chroma Verb. Especially for rooms. Mm-hmm. For longer so, stuff, it's Devalhalla Vintage, but for like rooms, it's, it's Chroma Verb for me. Just right, didn't right. really get in there and sculpt it, you know. I do have, on your recommendation, Nimbus and R4, which I also right. like. I just haven't used in a project yet, but I do really like them. Yeah, so, the Nimbus is beautiful sounding. Um, it is nice. Vintage. Granted, the guy yeah. who coded Nimbus used to write the code for the old lexicon boxes which is why it sounds like a lexicon yeah yeah yeah, so and unfortunately isotopes kind of discontinued nimbus now so i don't think you can buy it new anymore but i think i'm pretty sure that's what's driving neoverb it's like they kind of took nimbus and tied into ai dial in the reverb for you automatically magic that isotope has been doing their other plugins so i'm pretty sure that's the engine for neoverb so yeah that's something know. i wanted to bring up actually yeah. i'll just mention delay quickly if it's not the logic tape delay for me it's got to be bx delay 2500 delay. yeah yep absolutely a great plugin for me it's the logic stereo delay bx delays where the logic stereo delay ends you know what i mean yes. it's just like it, it has all the extra features that I wish the Logic Stereo Delay add. Yeah, and Logic uh, Stereo Delay is great. Yeah. yeah. But like, you know, but BX Delay, yeah. It's just yeah, BX magic. just takes it to the next level. I like it a little better than, <laughs> say, Supermassive because it's a lot quicker to get usable everyday sounds out of. Yeah, that's why um, I like it. You pull up yeah, the default yeah. thing and you can just tweak the knobs a little bit and that's it, and you're there. Yeah, it's got the ducking built in so I don't have to put a compressor yep. after the delay and do ducking anymore. That's great on stuff like vocals. And then if you want a modulated delay, it's got, you know, the chorus and flanger built in. The thing that yeah. I think blows everybody's mind when they first use MBX delay is the distortion. Like the saturation <laughs> on there just makes stuff cut through, you know. It's hard. About the only thing it doesn't really do is like the shimmer thing where you have like the pitch shift and the delay tails. That's not something you want to use every day either. So, <laughs> no, just on that, because you mentioned AI. Do you use AI stuff often when you're mixing? Because I don't personally. I, I can't get into it. Like, me neither. I keep thinking one of these days I'm going to like load Neutron in every track and Nectar on the vocals and Ozone on the master and then let the AIs yeah. all talk to themselves and start my mix for me and do I'll it. I'll let you know when I actually get around to trying that. Yeah, do it. Let me know how it turns out accessibility-wise. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the other hill we got to climb is accessibility. And yep. How not all plugins works. are made equal. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and like the isotope stuff, man, like when you can get to what you want quickly, it's great. And when you can't... It's not. You have bad <laughs> thoughts about what you want to do to the design or something. <laughs> you know? So it's like, the it's one... one of those things where it's like, I've gotten to the point, I think you, you can kind of attest to this. Yeah. I've gotten to the point where I just want a tool that's going to work. I don't care. If like, it does it, these days, the reverb like, pay all for me. You know, I'm not interested yeah. in that. <laughs> Personally. But like, here, here's the thing. Like, Good luck finding a plugin that sucks in 2023. You well, know yeah, I mean? that too. Unless it's accessibility wise, in which case we could probably find some. But yeah, we we can <laughs> be quicker to tell you which ones didn't suck in that case. But oh yeah, like Plugin Alliance are great. <laughs> exactly. You know, until you try to install them. <laughs> well, yeah, that's not fun. But then once you <laughs> once, once you eventually installed. figure that out, <laughs> they're really it's worth once it. Once you climb that hill, <laughs> and you then know. some wave stuff is pretty good as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, like the funny thing is when I started doing this, plugin alliance installers were accessible and waves weren't. <laughs> and, and now, now it's very much the opposite. accessible, but plugin alliance isn't. So <laughs> it's mad. Welcome to the changing landscape. But yep. <laughs> the the funny thing about this is like for me now, like I said, good luck finding a plugin that sucks. Like you can sit yeah. there and nitpick about whether the waves SSL or the plugin alliance SSL or the actual SSL. <laughs> SSL plugin sounds the best. And I'm sure someone already made that video on YouTube if you really yeah, care. Probably, yeah. <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, they're going to do what an SSL does to your audio, you know. And which one do you like? Use that one. <laughs> exactly. And for me it comes down to which one allows me to pull it up, get work done and quickly. Yeah, you know, in in a, in, in a timely manner and Minimal move on to the next about, thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know. it. And I think this, you know, like this is a point of conflict I get into with people all the time because there is this, I feel, notion that like we should have access to all the same tools that the professionals do, which is not a statement I disagree with. I completely wholeheartedly yeah. 100% agree with that statement. Yeah. But I want to mix today, not next year. You know what I yeah. mean? I want to work on music today. And so I'm going to use the tools that are accessible today. Or that because they're probably, you know, today. like you said, Waves, if the SSL plugin isn't accessible from SSL, yeah. but the Waves one is and the Plugin Alliance one is. It's one of those. You know? Yeah, the SSL, you want to get on to them about that and go, yeah. please change it to be accessible. Please but equally, you're not going to not mix. You know, yeah. you're going to use the Waves or the Plugin Alliance or the Native Instruments or whatever. Exactly. You're going to use it, you know. Yeah. I think that's done. the thing that people, you know, like, oh, you know, my favorite mixer, someone I look up to, or my professor at uni recommended insert Brand X here, you know? Mm. And it's like, okay, but Brand X version of that isn't the most accessible. However, yeah, but I like how that one sounds because I like how their mixers sound. Okay. Yeah, if but... I, it's an SSL compressor, just get another yeah. one. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, is it going to sound like of them out there. It's going to sound like an SSL. <laughs> <laughs> they no two SSLs options. sound the same. <laughs> well, no, this is also the case. Yeah, you know, you know I well, want it to sound like the hardware, man. Yeah, well, do you think two hardware units sound the same? No, exactly. They don't. <laughs> you know, and I, I will bet you good money the SSL that Waves got their hand on and the one that Plugin Alliance got their hand on and the one that Slate got their hands on and the one that SSL got their hands on <laughs> are not the same piece of hardware. So, no, they'll all be slightly different. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> and so the plugins are going to reflect those slight differences, but they're all in SSL. And like... You'll get stuff done, you know, and it'll sound good. When back in the, in the 80s and 90s, and it's like oh, we want you to mix this record. Like, okay, I got to find a room that's got an SSL to mix on because that's what I like to mix on. And yeah. if, like, their favorite room is booked and the project needs to be done by a certain date, they're going to book another room with an SSL to do it. Oh, well, yeah. And Which they're still going to mix it. Yeah. Still, it's going to be different from the usual one, but it's yeah. still an SSL. <laughs> it's still you know, a 4000 like, e or whatever, but, you know. So. Yeah, and if, like, the client... Does the client like the sound of the mix? Do you like the sound of a mix? Exactly. Because ultimately... You gotta disconnect and see the listener doesn't know, but they like it or they don't like it. Base mm -hmm. it on that, you know. I think that's the thing to remember is is it frustrating that brand X's version of it isn't accessible? Yes, it is. Do you wanna use it because that's what you've heard and that's what you like? I can appreciate that. But mm. Don't let that stop you from working. Don't let that stop no, you. No, you still from have access to SSLs, you yeah, know, for example. You know. Exactly. Are there. exactly. So, whether it's an SSL or a Neve or whatever, find, there find a version of it that from someone any else brand. Makes. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> Where you can kind of run into issues, something like the Amic 9090, that's not a console that is very well emulated in software. So, like, if you like that one, like, okay, yeah, it might be trickier to find like an exact copy of it elsewhere, but. If you want an SSL 4000E, everybody makes one of those. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you know, so or it's Neve like, or, yeah. Yeah, like, you, you and even so, find another Neve somewhere. You know, find another console somewhere that, yeah. that, that allows you to get work done. And, and try Maybe it's not a Neve that you want. Maybe actually an API or Focusrite is better, you know. Yep. And, and that's the thing, too, to remember, too, is 
the focus right much like the amic was designed by rupert neve so it still kind of yeah. has that neve sound to it yeah it'll be know? in there yeah so other consoles you know like the person who designed it grew up on ssls but ssls didn't do x so you know they so did. you have stuff like <laughs> that going on um, yeah but yeah neve ssl apis those are like the free main classic consoles and one of them is going to work for you you know it's just a yeah. matter of throwing <laughs> them on and, and seeing and seeing what you can get up to but also to me like the thing about mx 9099 that i like a yeah. lot part of what i like about it is you know it's laid out in a usable manner it sounds good and i can quickly do what i need to do with it you know it's got the high pass and low pass filters it's got the four bands which most console have but you know the low and high bands can be low shelves or bells. It has all the features I need, and I can work with it quickly. And, quickly, yeah. Get you know, stuff when done. When you find that combination of things, man, you just gotta run with it. You know. Yeah, rather than going, um, I've got to scroll all the way down to the EQ on this one. You know. Yeah, and, and that's a big <laughs> issue we have with Logic right now. That Apple or Juice or whoever needs to get in the same room and sort out because. Yeah. This is getting absolutely ridiculous <laughs> at this point. <laughs> that we get a plugin and we open it up, and Controls View is just an absolute mess of parameters. <laughs> yeah, the web got be merged up in a bit like that. <laughs> yeah, like all the parameters are there, and we can get to them. But like EQ, low cut, compressor threshold. Compressor release, EQ I cut. And it's just like anybody what else looking order? at this, they're in order. EQ low cut, EQ high cut, you know. Yeah. The compressor sections all together <laughs> further down, but not the control yeah. view version for us, you know. And it's like the Web Dabby Road stuff, you'll get a lot of stuff where it's like EQ V I M on dim slider. It's like that shouldn't be yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. It's like visual stuff that for some yep. reason has appeared in control view and is grayed out. It's like what yep. what's going on here? Oh yeah, you the know. meters the meters always show up too and you can't adjust them and you can't read <laughs> them. It's you know. so weird. Yeah. You know. It's just like Apple juice, whoever. Can we get you guys at the same table so you can have a yeah. conversation? You know? <laughs> have a chat, Apple and Juice. Yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd I'd love to moderate. <laughs> yeah, I would. I'll join them on that. <laughs> But outside um, of that, so this this goes back to what I was saying. Like at the end AI, of the day, like yeah. you know, you find something that allows you to to work quickly that gets you in the ballpark of what you're looking for. Go from there, you know, and and not get yeah. so hung up on is this the same exact yeah, compressor as someone else? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think so, just to touch on the AI thing as well. So I use other elements sometimes for mastering, yeah. and that's kind of it but also on your recommendation my dso go to is wave sibilance yeah because it's got ai going on under the hood which means i don't have to worry about it because i can't hear up there yeah so yeah. that's kind of where i cheat a little bit and use ai and presets because it's just easier for me because i can't hear up there and i don't really feel qualified to be there tweaking the yeah. controls and, and when it can just take that's... care of it for me that's a skill in and of itself is like trying to figure out what frequency you need to set the DSO, set the DSO yeah. to to clamp down on the s s s because it's slightly different for each person. You know what I mean? Well, if the and AI is which doing Mike it, then that's easier. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. And I, I, to touch on briefly something else you mentioned is presets. Like, don't be afraid of presets, but don't rely on presets either. You know, like, no. Presets um, are a great starting point. Yeah, that's the um, only time I rely on presets is when yeah. I'm using DSs because I yeah. just think I'm not really in a position to be <laughs> tweaking right, the control. Right, right, because, right. Especially without yeah. your hearing aids, eh? and I imagine it's even tricky yeah. then sometimes. Whereas, um, you know, even with sometimes it can be really tricky. So I just think, yeah. well, I'll just put a preset on there. I don't feel bad about that because it's not me just going, oh, I can't be bothered to do it. It's uh, yeah. literally, they're going to do better than me. <laughs> yeah the ai and, and the nice thing about siblings is it's tuned for voice so like it's not going to be good at like necessarily reducing high-end harshness or sounds in like General. a guitar amp sim for example you know like yeah. you might want a traditional de for something like that but yeah or, or like the weeks of an acoustic guitar you know you might want a traditional de for that but in the case of voice and vocals 
like is you tuned to listen it. to that specifically. <laughs> exactly. You know. Yeah. So it's useful for that. The other yeah. place where I've been using AI a lot myself too is Neoverb. Because hmm. reverbs are one of those things I just don't have the patience. Like something like Chroma Verb and Space Designer, I love them, but Jesus Christ, could you give us a few less presets? You know? <laughs> there like, are a lot in there. Y- you could go through drum plates for the rest of the week. <laughs> Especially in Space Designer. Exactly. <laughs> That's just. Uh, and, and Chroma if Verb, you buy... lesser, but. <laughs> If you by any chance happen to get the massive library of third-party impulses that float around it. the internet <laughs> for, like, every piece of vintage hardware's presets that <laughs> someone made IRs for and <laughs> nicely organized for Space Designer, yep. you can spend the rest of the year trying to decide what you want to put on your snare. That's why I don't use it. That's why I tend to use, like, Chromaverb or... Val- yeah. Val- vintage or like one of the Abbey Road things. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's you know. just like this. This goes back to what I was saying earlier. Presets are nice, but it, when you're trying to get work done, you just want something that's <laughs> going to sound good and get the job done and allow you to move on. And you know, so like I'll start off like as space designer, for example. You know, I, I, I this is I want this is a fast rock song, so I want a a tighter reverb you don't want this big reverb but you want some ambient song still yeah 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 so i'll look in the small room and find a plate there but if like if it's a ballad and you got more room for like the reverb then i might go look in the the large room and pick a plate from that so i narrow it down that way instead of going for all the different presets you know what i mean yeah but the thing i like about neoverb is this is where the ai comes in handy instead of me going through 50 presets and trying to pick one it's just like, all right, you know, set this up on my snare reverb bus, play a little bit of it, let it listen to the snare, let it tune in that reverb for that snare, pick some options, you know, yeah. high pass and low pass it, and, you know, it sounds good, it sounds clean, it sounds clear, and I spent a minimal of time on it, you know what I mean? So that's the one place where I like using AI. The things that either just take way too long, have way too many options, or is something that I just, like you said, with siblings, you know, you just can't hear it very well. It the funny thing about siblings is that was actually recommended to me by someone who just, like, they're a performer who got into recording themselves and, and producing themselves and mixing themselves. And, yeah. you know, to them, it was just like, wait, I can just put this on, pick a preset, and it sounds better than, like, what I was trying to do with a DS or, like... <laughs> Yeah, I'm just yeah. going to use this from now on. <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> I was so, using the, the stock logic one. I'm just yeah, going through yeah. presets and going from there. You know, yeah. using my mid-range hearing to go, oh, that sounds a bit nice, so I'll go with that. Yep, yep. You know? And even then, it's only because I would only use the presets if I felt like I wasn't qualified to go in and do it myself. Where if we reverb, yeah. for example, I'm less likely to use a preset, and I'll go and actually yep. sculpt it myself. Like in Chroma Verb, I have my own custom patch now that comes up as the default rather than the right, right, default right. one. And I'll just tweak that from there. Yeah. Or sometimes I won't. Sometimes, because it's my patch and I've already adjusted it, mm-hmm. I'll just bring the, dry, the wet down, for example, and that'll, do, yeah. that'll be it. So, you know, make your own presets as well. If you find a, a reverb yeah, or whatever that works... If you find something that works a lot, set it as a default too. Yeah. yeah. I'll, just, I'll even just save it as a preset because it'll probably mm-hmm. work again, you know. Don't do it for oh. every single thing that you do. Yeah, but, like, yeah. if it's a sound you use often, like, I'll use the Scar B bass sound quite a lot. Or if I know that certain musicians I work with tend to use the same basses or the same guitars often, and those particular EQ settings work, mm-hmm. same as a preset. Yeah, it and might work again. Whenever you work under stuff again in the future, you start with that. Yeah, because it's the same right. instrument, so it's probably right. going to work. Would have been and and this, this comes in handy for, for even if you're not working with clients, but if you're recording a lot of your own stuff, mm. once you've kind of gotten some sounds you like, save those as presets, whether they're like complete control instruments that you tweaked or guitar amp sims that you tweaked or whatever it yeah. is. And that way, you know, when you record the fifth song, you can get it done a little bit faster. Because you don't have to do it over and over and over again, you know. Yeah. If it's something that works all the time that you find, then you know, take that preset and set it as default to whenever you pull up the plugin, that's where it starts, you know. Yeah, and you don't have to worry about it. From there. 
Right. Yeah. And in Logic, all this is in that pop-up button that says manual or factor default or user default or whatever. You know, all those settings are there. Save save as default and, and you know, save as if you want to save it as a preset, etc. So Yeah. You know. And you can do it with channel entire channel clips as well, which is also yep. fun. Or yeah, you can save a patch in the library, which is like an entire signal chain, so you know, insert That's effects, really useful. pluses, yeah. et cetera. You know. For like your master bus processing, for example, you might want to do that. You can do a channel a channel strip setting or a patch or et cetera. I think we kinda of touched on, on everything, EQ compression delay reverb yeah uh, the, the saturation talked about uh, saturation kit. they drop in just soft tube saturation knob or sausage partner oh sausage partner i still need to yeah. play sausage partner i've heard a lot yeah of it's, about that. it's a weird that's one, also free isn't it it's very cheap i think it's like 20 dollars or something okay okay so like 15 pounds partner. it's quite right. cheap uh, Another one I like too is uh, Decapitator from Sound Toys. Oh yeah, the Sound Toys stuff is excellent. Yeah, yeah. Another another like excellent another great company, company that is on board with accessibility and, and trying to yeah. include more um, accessibility going forward. Top cheap so, as well, largely. So, I don't have a lot of their plugins, but, but what I do yeah. have, I really like, and it is very accessible. Yeah, their Soft Tube Central is pretty accessible. Install and stuff yeah. is pretty accessible. Their their website is very Pretty doable good. and i literally just got a console one which i'm um, enjoying that just ah. is in the process of becoming accessible that's something they're working on right now and i'm gonna be asking you about that probably down the line because yeah so, that sounds fun yeah the only thing i don't like about it is that it, like, i'm not using amic 9090 anymore <laughs> oh that's sad <laughs> because i'm using the soft <laughs> 2 console the ssl it comes with so that comes with it when you buy it no, another one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there, there's an SSL for you. And then I bought the British Class A, which is a Neve channel strip. Yeah. Um, British equals Neve. That one up. <laughs> so, British you know, equals Neve always. <laughs> yes, yeah. So I'm kind of getting into that and, and getting into that workflow and exploring that workflow a little bit. Speaking of which, talk about your workflow. Like, how do you find control surfaces and stuff like that versus um, just going into control view and tweaking stuff? Most of it is control view, but I do have a bare and direct touch just to do right. fader movements, like to do a mixed balance or whatever. That's more for automation and, and just getting big, broad stroke balance and stuff. Yeah, like not even automation, really. Like, I do bits of automation. If I do automation with it, it's probably going to be on there. But for the balance and volume and stuff, absolutely on there. Absolutely. So, like, when you first get your tracks in and you kind of get your rough balance together, you kind of like it for stuff like that or getting your final balance yeah. together. Yeah, if, if I'm... Mixing something else, and I think, oh, that's a bit loud. I'm gonna reach over and turn it down on the extra track rather than going close track, that window, find that track again, you know, yeah. <laughs> all of that. So you use it more as like big volume faders than anything else. Yeah, pretty much. That's kind of all I've found it useful for, to be honest with you. In, in fact, but it is very good at it. You know, it's yeah. very useful for that. So right, <laughs> it's so one thing, I'm, but it's great. <laughs> what I'm playing with now because console one also has a console one fader, which is ten faders. I'm thinking I'm gonna pair those two together and just use that for like use a fader for like basic transport and you know like you like you were talking about you know just in volume faders and stuff like that the console one will let you do adjust the the track volume and logic but it's just a track you have selected whereas with the fader you uh, can reach over and you know adjust whatever that's the ad adjust. advantage of it is that you can have yeah. you can have one track selecting and be like eqing it or still, whatever but if you want to reach over and just quickly pull a volume down you can do yeah. that or for me, like a lot of times, like, you know, I'll be working on the kick or the snare or something like that. And yeah. sometimes I just want to solo the drums, you know? Mm. And so you can just reach over and hit the solo on the drum track and have yeah. the drum soloed without taking your focus off of the kick or snare track or whatever. That's the advantage of it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I don't use it in the sense of at least not the X touch. I don't use the X touch in the sense of like using the faders to like tweak an EQ or something like that. No, I mean either. I just um, it's probably just, could. I just never got into it's, that. It's not a very accessible workflow for us. You, you really have to take the time to figure out what every fader is mapped to because like a sighted person can just look down at the scribble scripts and read on the screen. Yeah. And see how everything <laughs> is mapped. The nice thing about it is everything auto maps, but yeah, we still need to push still. each fader. <laughs> And hunt around on the screen to see what value changed to learn what everything got mapped to, you know. Yeah. And like, if you want to be nerdy about it, you know, you can go into the the CS the .CS file and 
arrange the order of the parameters <laughs> so that they show up in the order that you know and all that. But it's more hassle than it's worth. The thing that's yeah. nice about the console one is it's kind of like complete control. You turn a knob, it tells you what knob it is and the value of that knob. You know? Ah, that's nice. So it's, That is cool. You know, yeah, and so like the console one is laid out like the channel strip on a vintage console, you know, vintage SSL or Neve. You know, you got your input section, you got your high cut and low cut, you got your gate section, you got your EQ section, you got your compressor section, and you got your output section, which is like the console saturation. And yeah. those knobs are always the same. So if I switch from an SSL to Neve, the EQ it's knobs are the same, out. the compressor yeah. knobs are the same, the high cut and low cut knobs are the same. Unless you switch the order of the chain so you can go like, you know, compressor into EQ into gate or EQ into compressor, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be asking you a lot about that when we get when you sort of get into it because it sounds great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, like I said, the downside is you're stuck using the console one plugins. The good mm. thing is you're stuck using the console one plugin. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I say downside as in if there are other third party plugins you like to use, it's not necessarily all the one who just listed. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, it's not that the console one SSL is or needs or crappy either you know what i mean but does it um, sound like the weird ones <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> from that standpoint it looks it looks really really compelling and then you pair that with the fader i think i can get rid of my x-touch the x-touch is bulky you know it is so, a big thing yeah i mean this is a little flatter and wider but it definitely doesn't have the x-touch bulk to it so yeah i never seen like it, a, it's easier to travel with you know yeah like at Unio, i remember we had the avid S series or whatever they're called or yeah, the X one and then the artist series and whatever. Yeah. And I ended up seeing one and going, it looks like an X touch, but it's like a lot slimmer and a lot more compact. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like it's still a hundred millimeter fader like the X touch, but a lot slimmer, a lot less compact. So it's and a lot more to, expensive. <laughs> yeah, well there's that too. So you know so it's easier to travel with too. That being so said, there's nothing really wrong with the X touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the problem with the X-Touch is using it in that magical way of knowing what parameter is what, you know. If, if, yeah. if Complete Control ever came out with a Complete Control audio plugin, I think that ah. would just destroy everything right there. Yeah, I think that would be insane. Yeah. Load it in, map it, and go to town, you know. Yeah, and also because, yeah, because you'd have been access to like NKS third-party stuff. As yeah. well, that like would open up the possibilities for to example, God you know. knows what. Yeah, and sound toys and yeah, soft exactly. tube and exactly. And but then people like like people do with sounds, they make third party NKS packs. So what to say exactly. that's not going to happen with plugins as well? You know. But that's the thing, like all those plugins, like the the, the plugin alliance one. There's already like somebody already made a third party NKS map. Yeah. For all the plugin alliance plugins, it's just yeah. You can only load complete control on a software instrument track. What are you going to do about your drums or your guitars? Well, I guess drums can be software too, but, you know, Good like job, if no. you have a lot of audio <laughs> tracks in your project, like, you're stuck. You can't you can't use it there. So, yeah, if you could like, load complete control as an audio as plugin. As an audio, yeah. Yeah, that's the magic bullet right there. That know? would open so, up a lot of opportunities yeah. and Possibility um, and, or console it. one if that ever you know opens up to like third party other than just like the uad stuff you know case in point like they they make a lot of those plugins for native instruments it would be yeah. nice if it opened up to some of those plugins even being able to be used in console one as well yeah because then know? we could use like vintage compressors exactly in it, exactly which have parts of team I mean, anyway that being said it could probably be the same thing that's already in there just rebranded <laughs> <laughs> you know not too <laughs> so they might not need to do that because it's already done <laughs> mm -hmm. that most of what i use to be honest so what you got coming up for the rest of the year you're about to start your last semester of uni for everyone Rec i don't know yep. when this is going to come out but we're recording this it's either going to happen or it will happen <laughs> oh it's happening now <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, this came out when you heard it, but we're recording yeah. this in mid to late January yes. of 2023. So next week, you're going back to, to yeah. university to, to do your last year. And yep. you're doing a music technology degree? What are you what Production. Are you doing there? Media production, yeah. Production. Okay. 
Yeah. And so what what has that experience been like? How you how have you found doing this sort of stuff on the collegiate level? And yeah, what I are mean, you looking forward to in your last year? I mean, I'm looking forward to just having one last chance to play with these SSLs. <laughs> <laughs> one last in chance it. to play with all the stuff you'll never have in your home studio yeah <laughs> all because the you outboard. enjoy being able to pay your energy bill <laughs> yeah i do enjoy that and i enjoy being able to take my music anywhere but i'm going to enjoy you know just t- it's like i may it's here let's play with it if we're going to play with yeah, it let's do it yeah. now but i'm also looking forward to seeing what comes up you know i've got recording sessions and stuff booked in outside of uni and i'm looking forward to to all of those and so, seeing what mix work comes up and yeah is this a situation where because you're in university and you're interacting with people there that you you know fell into some of these gigs just from being sociable around university is, is not that even where... that but it's more that for bigger things like bands or whatever because i'm a student i am allowed to use their recording studios so when the bands want to record stuff we can get them into the university studios and do things there in theory i haven't done it yet but I have been told I am allowed to do it. If we can get that to work logistically, that would be great. Because I do need an engineer because there's so much like colour coded stuff. Using the SSL independently is tricky. Yeah. Even for a sighted person, so I'm told. So. <laughs> oh, no, I, I got another friend who's in a, a similar program out here and I was just visiting them and got to see some of those SSL rooms and stuff that they have there. And it's just like, yeah, man, it's it's... It's a lot to take in to try and work on a, on a big format <laughs> console like that, for sure. Yeah. What I was more asking about is, like, how did you find these bands to work with? Was that a matter of just being in college and socializing with other people in the program and, and, and talking to other musicians and taking yeah, it part it, of it's a lot of just activities? talking. It's a lot of just talking to people, like, in the local kind of area, you know, music scene. Like, my drum teachers help me get a lot of clients because, mm-hmm. you know, he's... he's quite well connected in the music scene here so i've been giving him like my cards and he's been handing them out and you know that's been great and people right. buying me through, through the website and stuff which is great but yeah a lot of it is coming from that from people you know it is who you know and it's you know making connections and doing things and people telling other people and it going from there really that's kind of the part that i really <laughs> wanted to touch on is just like some of this does involve having to talk to other people at some point in time and and, yeah. and work with other people and like you said your drum teacher you've been taking drum lessons so this is another person who knows other people that yeah you know, they hear your work and they're like oh yeah you know that that sounds decent and like oh you know anyone else i know is looking for something like that and you know yeah and, and he I know he worked with me on range. stuff as well yeah. so he worked alongside me and knows how i work and that i you know can do it and he's heard the mixes and yeah it's just great i think it's about just getting yourself out there and you know doing stuff on social yeah. media which i've been doing and yeah just getting yourself out there and well, spreading even before yourself as far social possible. media you're you're still you're participating in the communities you're part of because like earlier yeah. you said you were posting stuff in whatsapp group that's participating in a community so many people come into these communities ask their questions and then you never hear from them again until they have another question i think what a lot of people who are actually part of the community come to appreciate is like, you know, you may ask questions, you may not always have answers to give, but then like, oh, you know, I worked on this recently, I got this done. And that kind of motivates other people too that are part of the community. Oh yeah, let me finish my thing, let me share my thing, et cetera, et cetera. That was a good mix, I'll go and ask him to do it, you know, yeah, to help yeah, me with my know. thing, you know. Yep, exactly. And I think I think that's the thing too is like, don't just use these communities for your own personal thing, but be a part of them and give back to these communities. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, the WhatsApp community or your local university or your local music scene in whatever capacity that is, you know, if you're in an area where there's a lot of local gigs and you go to local gigs and, and talk to people at these gigs, that's one thing. If you're in university, there are other people in university that play other instruments that want to do things you know maybe you guys can work together on stuff and then like i said you know in the case of whatsapp that's another community where you can share stuff you're working on or in and instead of just asking for advice and and never really you know dealing and talking to any of those people you know yeah talk to people yeah like let's say like you come in like hey how do you do this in in logic or whatever die you're using and someone gives you an answer like if you get it sounding good, like you know, maybe you share that. Show and them. Like, hey, you know, Post it. about X Y Z, and yeah. you know, thanks for you know whoever gave me the answer. And by the way, here's what I was working on, and yeah. that helped me with this. You know, so 
Yeah, I think it's just about talking to people and being nice. Yeah. Being on be a nice person. Get people who want to work with you, you're a nice person. Exactly. <laughs> Outside of that, what are you looking forward to doing this year? You said you might be recording some projects. Like, what kind of classes or stuff are you going to be taking this year as well? That yeah, anything you're looking forward to there? Yeah, I mean, most of the stuff I'm looking forward to is the client stuff. You know, outside of uni, really. I'm just, I'm just really enjoying that and right. getting to. I've got some singer songwriters that I'm working with, which is nice, you know nice. kind of my happy space of working with singer songwriters, which is a genre I listen to a lot anyway. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy to be sort of working with people in that genre. You recording or just mixing or what are you doing there? Both. Both, okay. yeah, some recordings, some mixing, some so let's, hybrid. Let's touch you know. on that for a little bit. Because you say singer-songwriter, I think like acoustic guitar and vocals. Is, is a yeah, that it's that kind of thing, and then just building right. it to make it a bigger thing. Right, right, right. And that's that's kind of what really got me to appreciate using Logic, because with something like Drummer and like, you know, all the myriads of sounds that comes with, like, you could take a singer-songwriter, build a full band production around them, and not have to go buy anything else, you know? Yeah. In the case of getting that singer-songwriter into Logic, how are you finding the recording side of things, micing up an acoustic guitar, for example? How are you finding stuff like that? Yeah, I'm finding it pretty, because it's stuff I've sort of done before or learned about in uni and it's now just putting it into practice, you know, it's just getting to do that kind of thing and, you know, in the real world, as it were, right. rather than in the academic world and right. getting to do that properly, as it were, you know, in the real did, world. Did you have any challenge, great. though, with, like, figuring out, you know, where to point the microphone and how to, like, oh, approach so much. it? Cause, because I put so much research into it, YouTube or at uni, it kind of just all falling into place and it kind of makes sense then, you know, it's kind of like right. you've got to then just put that into practice what you've been told and it, right. you know, it's, they tell you to do it for a reason and it, it works, you know. How do you approach it with the client though when they're standing there with their guitar on or sitting there with their guitar on, like how do you like line up with like where to put the microphone and all of that um, stuff, you know. Case I'm, in point with an acoustic guitar, you might want to like one one very popular mic in front of acoustic guitar is to like kind of have the microphone around the say the twelve fret pointing towards the body of the yeah, guitar, for example. Absolutely, you know, and that that's saying. an easy one because I've felt mm. people, you know, how people have done it before. I've felt how people do it, right? So I just kind of mimic that and right. either get it right or not get it right, and then I'll just move it around until it does sound, you know. And I think that's the right. thing you've got to play with it. You can't just go. Yeah, you're I not did the thing that they up. did. You know, <laughs> you're not going to set it up and it's going to be in the perfect spot. Like you do. Have well, to I did the thing that they did. And it didn't sound good. I don't know what I, the mic's yeah. fault. You know, you got to just play with it. I think and yeah. just move it around until you get it to where it needs to be, and then eventually you work it out. But to be honest, a lot of what I'm doing, apart from like acoustic guitar and vocal, mm-hmm. a lot of it's in the box anyway, like programming stuff. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should save that for a separate video because if we go down that route, it could yeah, be another two well, hours, and I I got to wrap it up. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, trust me, we we could talk about production techniques, and that might that might be an, a, another good conversation. Except another to time, have. another time, yeah, definitely. That might be another good conversation. <laughs> we should to absolutely have, do just, it. Like, different we ways should do it though. Produce stuff. Um, yeah, we should and, do it absolutely. Yeah, just another yeah. time, not now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, we won't stop. <laughs> So to go back to the recording aspect of things, you just kind of use your your sense of touch, I guess, to make sure you're lining stuff up. Yeah. And then once you kind of know you're in the right ballpark, it's just a matter of like putting some headphones on. Get them to play a little play bit. And moving the mic around. and, and Record and it a bit, it. listen yeah. to it. Right. That's the key thing, record it and listen to it. Don't just listen to it for your headphones, record it and yeah. play it back and see how that sounds. That's how I do it, yeah. And then just so you, you just got to put the time in to get that part of it right. Yeah. But I think you also touched on something important where there is some value in being in a place where someone can show you how to set the stuff up, then it's just a matter of mimicking it, you know, and I think... Yeah, that's and I think Unity is useful for that. You yeah. it was useful for that, getting to see all that in context yeah, and stuff. We, we was... can't, like, watch a video and see how they do it then. No. And, and learn you can learn that, things so... from it, like the whole yeah. point in the mic of the 12th fret, but I think feeling it actually yeah. makes it a lot clearer. It's the equivalent of seeing it, isn't it? Right, you know, right. hearing someone talk about it and seeing it, it's the same thing. Yeah. You know, in this case. Yeah. So yeah, I, that, I think that's, that's something kind of that. to, to yeah. think about, too, is, you know getting into a place you know university program or something like that or even here in the states you know there's ic music which you know does have in-person studio sessions where you can get into a studio as a blind person with other blind people and kind of see how to do it get works. hands on yeah. how to do stuff like that and i think there, there's some value in doing stuff like that too and 
and getting familiar with stuff like that. Like I said, whether it's in a uni program or a, a blindness specific program, or if your high school's got a program, you know. Oh, just like in that. a studio generally. Yeah. It's or just, a studio, yeah, local recording. studio yeah. that might be willing to let you come in like during some downtime and and walk through stuff. Charge stuff. Don't yeah, don't don't be afraid to ask questions and. You know, if if you got to pay for an hour of studio time for the engineer to, to go through that with you, that's that's valuable. Don't be happy you know to do I mean? it though. If you're paying, yeah. it's going to be more than happy to do it. So exactly, I think like you know, community and and getting out and getting hands on with stuff is something that we have to be comfortable with to some extent, yeah. despite our disabilities. To really and be nice. What we want to do. That's, yeah. and, that's the key one as well. Be be mm-hmm. be a decent person. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, yeah, Listen, mate, I'm I, gonna I'm gonna have to wrap this up yep, because yep. yeah, it's getting late here. Thank you so much for your time, and I, I think you know we we kind of hopefully we touched on stuff that people are gonna find interesting and and happy to hear and all that stuff. Yeah, like I thought you made it you to know. the end. If you got any questions, leave them in the comments below. If it's something that I need Louis feedback on, I'll get an answer from him and yeah, post that or in a get in touch with me as well if you like. Yep, yeah. or maybe jump back on here and record record that for future FAQs video or something like that. That'd be so cool. Yeah. Leave any questions you have for me or Louie in the comments below. Yep. And as always, logic.band. If you want to get into any of this stuff in depth, then check out the members area, logic.band slash member, or logic.band slash training if you want to book some one-on-one training. If you want to do mixing or any of that stuff, check out Louie's website. And what is your website, Louie? My website is it's Louis Morehouse, which is my name, louismorehouse.com. And on social media, I'm either at Louis Morehouse or at Louis Morehouse Music. So you'll find me on there under those names. And that's Facebook, Twitter. What are you using? Yeah, these so at Louis Morehouse is Twitter and Instagram. Mm-hmm. And at Louis Morehouse Music is Facebook and okay. YouTube. Thank you so much Wicked. for your time. And, uh, no way. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Yes, yeah, as always, man. It's always a pleasure, and we always talk yeah. way too long. So we do. <laughs> <laughs> Look at how long well, this video is. <laughs> yeah, we it need me. The, the original recording was longer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Anyway, right, before we say anything else, goodbye, everybody.